We could travel all the way from the Atlantic Ocean to the Bosphorus in just a few days. The railway had brought together the most distant reaches of Europe. Distance didn't matter anymore. Anything seemed possible. All we had to do was just wish hard enough. As children, we were thrilled by the rush of speed that the new technologies gave us. The future was within our grasp. It seemed so bright and solid. But we had no idea just how shaky the foundations of that future were. Not until the summer of 1914. On that first day of August, I was looking for my father out in the fields. The bells had been ringing for hours. When it is not a feast day, the bells chime only when something bad has occurred. The ringing was not only in our village, but also in the neighboring town. How different the bells sounded on that day, as if they were calling for help. My father was a colonel in the Kuban Cossacks, a proud, hard man. On this day, he hugged and kissed me without a word. He had never done so before. earlier. Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia. On June 28, 1914, the city's expecting the Habsburg crown prince, Franz Ferdinand. Suddenly, shots ring out. Franz Ferdinand and his wife are murdered in broad daylight. The death of the heir to the throne plunges Europe's oldest ruling house into mourning and towering rage. For it becomes quickly known that the instigators of the attack came from its neighbor, Serbia. The Austrian generals call for a war against terrorism, a punitive expedition against Serbia. In Sarajevo, a state of emergency is declared and the army is mobilized. But Serbia asks mighty Russia for help, while Austria puts its hopes on her ally, Germany. Das unterschreiben wir dir nie. Ich muss an die Front. Hör auf, mich wie ein Kind zu behandeln. Du bist unser Kind. Das Vaterland braucht dich noch nicht. Ein Jahrgang nicht, aber mich, mich braucht es. Karl argues against it with every reason he can think of. I feel somewhat grateful that he should fight for him. Kata Kollwitz is Germany's best known artist. Her themes are social destitution, protest and death. 
She's a confirmed social democrat who lives with her family in Berlin. Her husband, Carl, is a doctor. The German Empire, with its rapidly growing capital, has become a modern major power. But it is the conservative Prussian nobility that holds true power. At its head is Emperor Wilhelm II, a ruler who seems to be confusing reality with theatrical posturing. Wars against neighboring states are what united Germany in the first place, but have also driven it into isolation. The country feels surrounded by hostile powers. Only Austria-Hungary, ruled by its ancient emperor Franz Josef, remains as an ally. And Wilhelm does not want to let him down. A feeling of pressure and inconsolability. Of the impossibility of sacrificing Peter. Du hast mir einmal versprochen, dass ich niemals feige sein muss. Nie. Was hat das mit Feigheit zu tun? Alle gehen sie. Ich kann nicht zurückbleiben. Dieser Krieg, er wird alles ändern, alles besser machen. Verstehst du das nicht? Discussion is pointless because deep inside the boy is fighting with himself. The German war plan calls for its army to advance against arch enemy France first. Neutral Belgium is regarded as a thoroughfare. Paris should be occupied within six weeks. Only then can the army be turned against France's ally Russia in the east. It is a plan for a war on two fronts. But the Germans rely on the speed and force of their attack to quickly knock out the French first. During the first days of August 1914, the German Empire declares war against its neighbors, Russia and France. The men stirred up their courage and defiance in the face of death. They showed no emotion. I remembered an old war tradition which my father had told me about. The women follow the fighting Cossacks and stay as close as possible to the army. Why should it be any different this time? rang in our ears, war, war, war. Against whom and why? The Tsar had ordered it, and a Cossack never asks. Fourteen-year-old Marina Yurlova comes from a small village in southern Russia. Her father is always in readiness for war, like all Kuban Cossacks. The Cossacks form the Tsar's bodyguard and revere him as a semi-divine being. 
Under Tsar Nicholas II, the vast Russian Empire is still ruled according to medieval principles. The army, the church, and the secret police wield unlimited power in the name of the Tsar. But at the same time, Russia has the highest economic growth in Europe. The working class is growing steadily. But only a few benefits from this upturn. The majority of the people live in abject poverty. More and more revolts break out, threatening the power of the Tsar. For the ruling elite, war seems to be a panacea that could give a new shine to the monarchy. The divided country can be reunited under the banner of Russian Orthodoxy in defense of their fellow Slavs. People of all nations are convinced that they are being attacked and believe that they must defend their homeland. Germans, Russians, and the French alike each goes to war with seemingly compelling reasons for doing so. Der Junge muss über sich selbst bestimmen. So haben wir ihn erzogen. Wir haben ihn noch nicht erzogen, damit ein braver preußischer Soldat aus ihm wird. Kaiser Gott und Vaterland, Gitte? Wirklich? Das sind die Geiser aus dem Spiel. Diese Jungen, sie sind so, so, so wie eine Flamme, so unbedingt, so glücklich, so ganz. Vielleicht beneidest du sie nur um diese Möglichkeit des freien Opferns. Was hast du zu verantworten? Nicht der Junge. Nicht der freie Wille. Du. And now it was all done. That sacrifice my son drew me to, and to which we drew Carl. I must say something about my altered attitude towards the war. For the first time, I felt the absolute togetherness of the people. I felt I was beginning anew, as though none of the old values were left, as though everything had to be put to the test. The war volunteers, especially the middle-class boys and students, have only one concern. Not to arrive at the front too late when the glorious victories have already been won. Their former lives appeared stultifying. Now at last, everything makes sense. Their almost hysterical enthusiasm needs a new German term to describe it, the August experience. Auch schon zu voll. Peter geht gleich wieder. Peter and the others went early for a checkup and to the barracks. They returned at six o'clock. They'd all been turned down. Hope that we might be able to keep him at home. Penis ist auch Platz. Sag es ihm nicht. Käthe, bitte! In solchen Zeiten, in times like these, one stupidly realizes that these children are going to war. Das Ganze so the whole thing is so desolate and mad. This silly thought that surely they will not take part in such madness. And then, like a cold shower, you realize they must. They must. They must. If 
vorherigen Jahre hatte ich Glück. Last year I was lucky and went free, because at 15 I had cut through my thumb with a circular saw and it hadn't healed properly. But this time I went anxiously to the recruitment office and submitted to everything they expected of me. Na, welch Prachtexemplar von einem Krieger haben wir denn da? Kasser, Karl. Schon 26 Jahre und letzten Jänner ausgemustert. Ausgemustert? So, so. Willst du nicht für deinen Kaiser ein paar Serben verdreschen, guter Mann? Ja, wenn es bei den Serben bleiben tät, die Russen... Die Russen, die Serben, die Bosniaken, die brauchen immer alle eine Tracht Prügel. Hose runter. <lacht> Na, Herr Hochwohlgeboren, da unten ist alles in Ordnung. Aber schauen Sie mal da, ich kann ja keine Faust machen mit dem Daumen. Ach so. Na, dann wirst du die Granaten mit der anderen Hand werfen müssen. Tauglich. Weiter. Karl Kasser ist 25 Jahre alt. Er ist ein Farmer und lebt in Kilb in Lower Austria. Wie like viele Farmer ist er nicht keen, auf dem Feld der Ehre zu sterben. Eher seine eigenen Felder müssen geplaut werden. Kasser's homeland has been ruled for over six decades by the Emperor Franz Josef. The dual monarchy of Austria-Hungary is a multi-ethnic state comprising eight nationalities and 17 different lands, a unique melting pot of cultural diversity. For many years, it has been run and indeed dominated by a ruling elite of German and Hungarian officials. But now this giant empire threatens to fall apart Poles, Czechs, Ruthenians, Romanians, Croats, Italians, and Bosniaks all strive for independence. Ironically, the war will now unite all these peoples once again beneath the banner of the Habsburgs. All those who had previously been designated as unfit were now taken on, even those up to 42 years of age. I was assigned to the 80th Galician Infantry Regiment. It wasn't easy, being assigned to a Polish rather than German regiment. Uniforms are riddled with holes, so that we get to practice our sewing skills. Hey, Kamerad, can you give me the jacke rüber geben? The jacke, can you give me the Also, I don't know who von euch hier Deutsch versteht, but I say it nur einmal, yeah? Knöpfe lassen sich annähen, but the shoes sind wirklich wichtig. You werdet eine Unmenge marschieren müssen. Bis Moskau ist ein weiter weg. Also. Although I knew I was not alone in this, my heart was heavy at the thought of leaving behind all that I loved and that was dear to me, and heading into the unknown. Austria may have started the war, but it was very badly prepared for the conflict. Austria's war plan is to throw its main force against the much smaller country of Serbia to its south. The long border the Empire shares with Russia is weakly defended. But the Russians advance with strong armies much faster than the generals in Vienna expected. Their war plan in its entirety has been betrayed to the enemy by a spy in the general staff. During their advance, chaos erupts. The result is a traffic jam a hundred kilometers long. Many soldiers were not motivated to fight for the small upper class of Germans and Hungarians, especially among the Slavic-speaking populations. Sympathy for their enemy is widespread. Their own officers did not even speak the same language as them. Many Serbs and Poles living in Austria were expected to march against their compatriots living in neighboring countries. 
jeho apoštolskému veličenstvu, našemu knižeti a pánu Františku Jozefu I. Hey, apostolico di Ungheria, granduca di Toscana. La nostra devozione del nostro dovere. Bitvach, bujach, starčach i předševzienčach všelkiego rodzaju. Trupele nostre, stragurile nostre, drapelele nostre. Verständnis einzulassen, uns immer so, wie es den Kriegsgesetzen gemäß und braven Soldaten zusteht, zu verhalten und auf diese Weise mit Ehre zu leben und zu sterben. So war uns Gott helfe. Amen. I swore the oath. It lasted almost half a day, because it was spoken in five languages as so many nations were involved in it. We were dead on our feet. The food and the lodgings were so bad, we had already begun to despair. We then marched fully equipped to the hell that awaited. A cold sweat came over us as we realized things were about to get serious. Stell dir vor, ausgerechnet in Neuruppin ist noch ein Platz frei geworden. Das ist ein echtes altpreußisches Regiment. I sewed French and Russian money in Peter's jacket, but then I took it all out again, because if he were taken prisoner, he could be executed if French banknotes were found on him. I'm only sewing in German gold now. Gleich in die Kaserne. England hat uns den Krieg erklärt. Hast du was anderes erwartet? Jetzt sind alle gegen uns. Es ist zu spät, Karl. Danke, Mutter. Das werde ich dir nie vergessen. On the 4th of August, Great Britain declares war on Germany. In England, the people's anger is vented in the looting of German-owned shops. The invasion of neutral Belgium has triggered a wave of indignation. 100,000 soldiers are sent to Belgium. The involvement of the world's foremost superpower with their colonies and dominions on all continents transformed this European conflict into a world war. Du wirst sehen, in ein paar Wochen bin ich wieder daheim. Ich grüße Paris von dir. We kissed goodbye. He thanked me. I thanked him. Suddenly I sensed something. My son will die. I bade farewell to my darling today. Just as the train started to move, I was gripped by a sudden fear. For at this time, I was letting go of everything that made life worth living. Dear mother, you will see I have left Aberystwyth as you feared. My only two real friends have gone. I haven't done anything to make you ashamed as my mother and father, but rather I believe that this will be something to make you respected. My nerves had reached their limit. It seemed likely I'd never see my family again. I couldn't hold back. The tears welled up in my eyes. Leaving for the front. What a sad day. 
I asked my wife not to come with me to the station to say goodbye. It would have taken away whatever courage I had left. I kissed my Nuria for the last time. She calls out. You promised not to cry. I feel ashamed. Most my comrades are singing. I cannot stop crying. Можно мне с вами? Если ты этого хочешь, девочка. До границы на фронт можно? Все равно, когда мы приедем на фронт, война уже закончится. Ну поехали! Я не преувеличу, если я скажу, что я не испытывала. I am not exaggerating when I say that I felt neither remorse nor fear. I was a Cossack. I was driven by a blind instinct to follow the men into war. To be caught up in the tide was an adventure for me, just as I had always imagined it would be. In the late summer of 1914, trains like this roll on throughout Europe. For years, military planners on all sides have been working toward this day when word would come, it is war. For the first time in history, the benefits of progress enabled millions of soldiers to be mobilized at a stroke. A minutely planned operation begins. Each soldier is assigned to a railway carriage and each railway switch set. Every nation rushes into the war, convinced that they had prepared as well as possible for a swift victory. Tuesday, August 4th, 1914. Dad has told us that war has been declared between France and Germany. The 20th, the 30th, and 147th regiments have already left for the border. The soldiers are very happy. From here, we can hear the cannons. Allez. Mange. The Battle of Altkirch has been confirmed. Our soldiers took the town with their bayonets, and our cavalry went after the German rear guard. The Alsatians cheered on the French army, who were triumphant. Ten-year-old Yves Congar grows up in Sedan in northern France. His father is too old to fight in the war. But he can still remember very well the last war, the catastrophe of 1871. Yves' hometown played a key role in this war. It is here that the decisive battle against France's arch-enemy Germany was lost. After its defeat, France had to relinquish its rich provinces of Alsace and Lorraine, a national trauma. In the perception of the French, its mighty German neighbor turns into a bloodthirsty monster with which one cannot negotiate and which must be defeated at all cost. Because of this, France has patiently and successfully crafted an alliance with Russia, which was later joined by Great Britain. Mais c'est nous qui avons les meilleurs avions, n'est-ce pas, papa? Voilà un vrai gars qui lâche ses bombes sur les bords. Je les vois nulle part, tes avions. C'est normal, ils se cachent derrière les nuages. Et puis, boum, ils vont tout faire exploser. La grande bataille. Great battle has not begun yet. For every German plane in the sky, we respond with cannon fire.
Nous en avons Today, déjà. we shot some down between Florentville and Carignan. Les avions allemands. German flyers reached our town, then they turned away again. Ils ont changé de cap. Most people cannot fathom the kind of war that is about to be unleashed upon them. Proud heroes on high horses no longer play a role. For years, the great powers have been operating huge armament industries, amassing weapons of unimaginable destructive power. Great Britain and Germany had been involved in a bitter arms race since the turn of the century, developing armored battleships the size of floating islands. During this war, the fighting would enter new realms for the first time. The skies above. Airplanes and zeppelins, those marvelous creations of the latest technology, are transformed into killing machines. In my heart, a sort of ceasefire had set in. I did not need to cry anymore, and occasionally I was happy. As long as the boy is still alive, the feeling creeps over me that everything will perhaps not be so bad. Moreover, there are good reports of the war in France. It might be all over in a few weeks' time. On the eastern front, the battle has been raging for days. If you're quiet and pay close attention, you can feel the ground shake softly. It's a sinister feeling. Die Russen morden Frauen und Kinder in Ostpreußen. Eine, die dabei war, das auf dem Markt erzählt. Du willst mich doch bloß erschrecken. Da falle ich nicht drauf rein. Sie haben eine Frau an den Scheunentor genagelt. So. Die Russen kommen doch nicht hierher. Oder? 12-year-old Elfriede Kur is growing up in Schneidemühl in the province of Poznan. The girl lives with her grandmother and attends the small town school. Schneidemühl is located on the eastern edge of Germany. The border with the part of Poland annexed by Russia is only a few kilometers away. Like many school children across Europe, on August 1st, 1914, Elfriede begins to keep a war diary. Wie heißt es doch so schön im deutschen Dichterwort? Viel Feind, viel Ehr. Deswegen werden wir als In der Schule at school, the teachers have told us it is a duty towards our fatherland not to use foreign words. Initially, I didn't know what they meant by that. Beginnen wir mit dem Französischen. Eine Sprache, die sich wie ein Krebsgespür in unserem schönen Deutsch breit macht. Now I understand. We shouldn't use the word adieu, it's French. Es ist uns eine Ehre, leb wohl, oder auf Wiedersehen zu sagen. Meinetwegen auch Grüß Gott. Wir haben eine kleine Blechkasse gekauft, in die wir fünf Pfennige legen wollen, wenn wir uns versprochen haben. Der Inhalt dieser Kriegssparkasse wird zum Einkauf von Strickwolle für unsere tapferen Soldaten verwendet. Aber meine Mama sagt immer... Wir bezeichnen eine deutsche Mutter nicht mit diesem weichlich gallischen Namen. Mama muss From now on, I am to call Mama Mutter. But Mutter isn't gentle enough. I think I'll say Mutter. Na, das kann ja interessant werden. Fesselnd, Elfriede. Es heißt Fesselnd. The German strategists don't expect a quick Russian attack. But already in August of 1914, two seemingly unstoppable armies advance into East Prussia. The Tsar's war plan is brutally simple, to push forward with millions of soldiers towards Berlin. After just a few days, Germany is fighting on two fronts. The people are restless. I have heard that some families have already left Schneidemühl. 
Trenches are being dug just a few kilometers outside the city. Was du denn da, Alfredo? Ich... Ich versuche nur eine Übersicht über unsere Vorräte zu bekommen, falls... falls wir auch weg müssen. Es sind heute schon wieder Flüchtlinge aus Ostpreußen durch die Stadt gezogen. Ich gehe nicht weg aus Schneidemühle. Dann bleibe ich bei dir. Oh! Kommt der Großmutter, hab doch keine Angst. Der Kaiser sorgt schon für uns. Oh, Kindchen. Kindchen. L'Allemagne a envahi le territoire belge. Et l'Angleterre vient de déclarer la guerre à l'Allemagne. Dix nations sont maintenant en guerre. Les Belges ont fait sauter deux ponts. Il y a aussi de la dynamite sur les ponts de Sedan. Qu'est-ce qui se passe, papa Les Allemands. Ils approchent. Mais papa, on a presque libéré l'Alsace. Les boches ont fui comme des lapins. C'est écrit ici. Arrête avec ça, Yves. La seule chose pour laquelle tu peux croire ce que disent les journaux, c'est la météo. Pas ce qui se passe à la guerre. Il semble que ce ne soit pas vrai. C'est tout ce que je peux dire. Mon père avait dit que c'était right. From here, you could hear the endless sound of the cannons. Also the sound of firearms and machine guns. Granddad, for whom the war of 1870 was the big war, wonders if the whole town won't explode. The war impacts upon an affluent continent. It sweeps over a densely populated area, spreading fear and terror. Their future uncertain, women, children, and the elderly flee from the advancing armies and their deadly shells. Hundreds of thousands flee from East Prussia ahead of the Russian army. 100,000 Jews leave Galicia for Vienna. In Belgium, more than 800,000 people try to escape the advancing Germans. But the situation is worse in Serbia. Millions of panicked people seek refuge from the hate-filled Austro-Hungarians. Europe has not seen anything like this for over a hundred years. Our mother embraces us with her arms like wings. There's no water anywhere, only in the hoof prints of the horses. With a spoon, we scoop up tiny mouthfuls of the sloppy liquid. This place is worse than a wasteland, with nothing but ashes ahead of us. And in the middle of the ashes, human souls, freezing and hungry. Emil went away with one pair of shoes. And after that, I haven't seen the poor boy again. I often remember him together with my other brothers and sisters, but Emil, I remember most of all. We only had time to take what we could fit into a suitcase. I only had one thought in my head. Where were we to go? Where, for God's sake, could we go? Those fleeing were running into each other, as though they were escaping a burning theater. Friendliness, humanity, it was all swept away. Tuesday. Terrible Tuesday. They're here. The barbarians are walking past our house. I hear a soldier bark out an order. Nous entendons un ordre brutal. 
It sounds something like... Everything in the military strategy of the French was focused on the offensive. Their generals believed they would win a new war through their policy of permanent aggression. Their war plan is aimed at a rapid reconquest of the lost territories in Alsace-Lorraine. The superior spirit of their troops deemed to be crucial for victory. There are no defensive preparations. However, the French offensive stalls after a few days, while conversely, the mighty German war machine advances with great rapidity, penetrating deeply onto French soil. Three weeks into the war, German troops occupy Sedan. The Germans are at Monsieur Benoit's front door, ensuring that no soldiers are hiding there. As a precaution, they shoot his dog to stop his barking from alerting the French about the German patrols. The Germans are monsters and thieves, assassins and arsonists. I'm sure I'll never experience anything so horrible in the rest of my life. The German advance through Belgium is blighted by war crimes and atrocities. The troops expected to make their transit unopposed, but the Belgians offer stiff resistance. We are a country, not a thoroughfare, is their rallying cry. Rumors about Belgian franc tireurs and guerrilla warfare abound. Church towers are destroyed because they could house observation posts. Many venerable buildings of irreplaceable value are ruthlessly torn down. Hostage taking and firing squads account for more than 6,000 deaths and upset people all over the world. The German advance provided the best possible raw material for Allied propaganda. The atrocities actually committed were embellished with outright fabrications. It is claimed that German soldiers shoot women and slaughter infants out of sheer bloodlust. Such reports were especially common in Britain and her empire, where there was no compulsory military service and the army relied on its ability to recruit volunteers. In reality, the worst atrocities were committed by the Austrians in Serbia. Any people considered hostile to them are brought to heel with mass executions. The Russian invasion of East Prussia triggers public fear in Germany as more brutal atrocities are expected. The Cossacks plunder and pillage in conquered territories. The German army throws all available reserves towards the east. Gott der Herr hat unseren tapferen Soldaten die Hand geführt und ihre Waffen gesegnet. Die Russen sind zu Tausenden zerschmettert worden mit Mann und Ross und Wagen. The Kaiser. the Kaiser has ordered that after so many victories, school should be cancelled. The news came so late that we still had to have math and geography. Oh, I hate it. viel mehr Tote und mehr Gefangene gegeben als bei Seda. Jeden Tag so eine Schlacht. Wir müssen nie wieder in die Schule. Kur. At the end of August 1914, the German army manages to strike a devastating blow against the Russians in East Prussia. The attempt to defeat Germany with a rapid offensive from the east is thus thwarted. About 100,000 Russians are taken prisoner. More than 30,000 die in the Masurian marshes. 
Ich muss die ganze Zeit an die Russen in den Sümpfen denken. Stell dir vor, wie sie untergehen. Erst die Brust, dann die Schulter, dann das Kinn, dann der Mund und alles. Elfriede, das ist unheimlich. Langsam macht der Krieg keinen Spaß mehr. Bis Weihnachten ist alles vorbei. Hauptsache, wir verlieren nicht. Großmutter sagt, wir haben noch nie einen Krieg verloren, seit sie lebt. Das ist schon ziemlich lange. Und den verlieren wir auch nicht. Also, meine Herren, dann äh, wünsche ich guten Appetit. Wollen wir uns mal schmecken lassen und mal sehen, was die... Was die we are lucky still to be alive. Everything feels unreal. But we shall have to get used to it. The town is filled with Germans. A German officer, Captain Nemnik, is living with us. Regarde, pour toi. So matin, in the morning, he had four chickens cooked. His ordnance officer ate a whole one himself. Qu'est-ce que tu as écrit là Les devoirs de l'histoire. De quoi ça parle Des uns. In history class, I read the Huns came to France and burned everything that stood in their way. Is it possible after 1400 years we have such a barbaric and destructive race once again in Europe? We'll leave evidence of their cruelty wherever they go. These pages on which I write the truth. October 10th, 1914, Antwerp has fallen and the sky is once again blue. Ach, Karl, das ist ein Zeichen. Es muss ein Zeichen sein, wo er doch gerade an die Front abgerückt ist. Diese Ferne, Käthe. Ich weiß, Karl. Ich weiß. Heute geht es nicht anders. For the first time in our lives today, on October 10th, we dedicated Social Democrats. We are hanging out the Kaiser's black, white, and red flag from the boys' room for both Peter and Antwerp. Above all, though, for Peter. The conquest of Antwerp is celebrated by the Germans, nine weeks after the invasion of Belgium. However, according to the plan, it should have taken just nine days to pass through the country. The fierce resistance of the Belgians has not been planned for by the Germans, nor the penetrative punch of the British Army. In a battle lasting several days, the British and French troops halt the German advance just before Paris. It is a turning point of the war, known in France as the miracle of the Marne. It is an extremely important victory following the many defeats of the first weeks of the war. Further German offensives are unsuccessful, but the counter-offensives of the Allies also stall. The troops are exhausted and barely able to fight. After only three months of war, more than one million soldiers have fallen. It is my sad duty to inform you that your son, in the accomplishment of his duties towards king and country, has given his greatest sacrifice to the Republic for the glory and honor of France. May you and your family accept the eternal gratitude of the great Habsburg dynasty and of all its members. Rest assured that his death was neither in vain, nor will it ever be forgotten. It was during our most recent attack that your son bravely rushed forward, and we, the officers, share your grief at the death of this wonderful comrade and kind-hearted man. We buried him where he fell. It's 
wird eine Nachricht von seinem Regiment sein. Vielleicht ist er verwundet. Vielleicht kann er nicht schreiben. Oder Gott behüte gefangen. We had built a network of light and steel beneath the streets. And we loved this mysterious new world. Here, it was never too hot and it never rained. We had the grandest plans and dreamt of new cities underground. An underground railway was considered absolutely essential for any true capital city. In London, they had the first one. In Berlin, they always ran on time. And in Paris, the trains ran on electricity instead of steam. 
We had lost our fear of the bowels of the earth until the summer of 1914. We marched for two days in very bad weather, without rest, without sleep. On top of that, we had to carry 40 kilograms of equipment. Then we were told to cross a swamp. It didn't seem too dangerous. I told myself that everything would be all right, that I would get through this. I took a few steps and sank up to my stomach. To keep from sinking any further, I had to avoid struggling. I just stood there. And as I watched the bodies of my friends float by, I began to think that this was also going to happen to me. That I too would meet a miserable end. I can't write, can't think connectedly. Can't get the idea of anything in any fullness. I wrote last week to the war office to ask if there's any chance of getting over the difficulty of my few years over the limit of age. Charles Edward Montague is the son of a former Catholic priest. He studied at Oxford University. He has always been a staunch pacifist until the outbreak of the Great War. In the autumn of 1914, a small British army of professional soldiers, together with the French armed forces, managed to halt the German advance. In the process, they are nearly wiped out. Without new recruits, the British units are barely able to continue fighting. But the Empire is the only major power in Europe that doesn't have military conscription. War Minister Lord Kitchener now appeals to all men to become soldiers in a so-called new army. The response exceeds all expectations. Each month, more than 100,000 civilians sign up. The age limit is set at 41 years. Charles Edward Montague, mountaineer, swimmer, sporting fit. Hmm. 41 years old, sir. Do you have a family? A wife and seven children, sir. And are things so bad at home that this will be your gift to your wife for Christmas? Sir? Montague, how old are you? I mean, your real age. Don't you dare take me for a fool. I just wanted to fight, like the rest of the country. I felt an appetite for danger. And after all these years sitting behind a desk, a passion for any fresh enterprise. In a word, Life. 48, sir. But only just. You know, it's rather scandalous what you're doing here. If I hadn't seen that life saving metal ribbon on your jacket, I would have had you hauled off. Understood? Yes, sir. Montague, out there, you won't be saving any lives, you'll be killing. Is that clear to you? At the beginning of 1915, the Warring Nations is still mobilizing new reserves of men. They need to replace the million casualties who fell in the first months of the war. Most of these new soldiers 
have never handled a weapon before. But they will now form some of the largest armies the world has ever seen. All efforts to achieve a quick victory have so far failed. Now these new recruits will at last decide the outcome of the war. A conflict that began in Europe has become a world war. More than 20 million men have taken up arms, including those from countries such as Japan and the vast Ottoman Empire. The war is fought on the high seas. Volunteers from Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and India are shipped in to support the British Army. For these new soldiers, their baptism of fire is imminent. After four weeks of training, we leave Pilsen towards the Serbian front. We're marching to go and kill men who have done nothing to us. God wishes it, the army chaplain told us in his sermon. No soldier in our camp knew why we were fighting. We didn't know who was right, the French or the Germans. We would fight in the French army. That was all we were ever told. In the afternoon, ammunition and rations are handed out. Tests for venereal disease, then decampment. The mood was joyful. We have no doubt that the war, which has been going on for five months, will come to an end with our arrival. But how exactly will it end? The order has come that we are to move to the forefront of the battle, to enter the scorching flame of the firing line. We Maori are now off to finish what we came here for. Hey, hey, Kamerad! Kamerad, hilf mir doch! Hilf mir! Komm! Auf den Moment willst du doch nicht ankommen! Hilf mir doch! Hilf mir! Komm! Farmer's son Karl Kasser was born in 1889 in Lower Austria. Because of his crippled hand, he was not considered a suitable recruit. But after the terrible winter campaigns of 1914, the army of the Habsburg Empire can no longer be choosy. The dual monarchy of Austria-Hungary has suffered heavy defeats against the massive forces of the Russians. Even tiny Serbia, the reason for the World War, was able to beat back the troops of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Reinforcements are mobilized from every nook and corner of this multi-ethnic state. Older men with families and even men who were initially passed over are sent as reinforcements to the collapsing Eastern Front. It is unbelievable what a man can bear. The horses were collapsing all around us, one after the other. They could not take as much. There is no turning back, ever forward. I had the rotten luck to be blown up while instructing our company in bombing. It was not a great report, but a strong flame. I was pushed back by the explosion. When I looked round, I saw half a dozen men in great pain. Accidents like this happen all too often in the British Volunteer Army. Experienced instructors are sadly lacking. Many of those in charge have only recently entered the military themselves. In the spring of 1915, time is terribly short as one million civilians are transformed into soldiers. 
Montague, Montague, you dare take me for a fool. How old are you? How old are you? I mean, you're real age, and don't you dare take me for a fool. You, you were lucky now, friend. Luck, luck, luck. Call this luck. My moustache is gone. I suppose my wife never liked it anyway. The hair. That trouble. When can I go back to the men? You'll have to be patient. Thus, my journey came to an end. I had been traveling for weeks, always following the army, searching for my father. Now I could go no further. I had not eaten in days, had not talked to anyone. I felt lonelier than ever before in my life. Не бойся. Я козин. Пойдем со мной. Пойдем. Marina Yurlova is 14 years old when she reaches the Russian-Turkish border in the Caucasus after weeks of wandering. Her father, a colonel of the Kuban Cossacks, was called upon the first day of the war. Since then, his daughter has been looking for him in vain. The Cossacks are the Tsar's finest cavalrymen. They have a reputation as bold and fearless warriors as they march against the Turks in the south of Russia. The Ottoman Empire, Russia's arch enemy, has entered the war in the autumn of 1914. Now the fighting extends to the Caucasus and the Black Sea. Это быстрый, а это влачи. Но с ним надо быть очень осторожным. Он может укусить. А вот это Архип. Он у них вожак. И ведь не боишься лошадей, девочка? Можно? Я не боюсь лошадей. Я не девочка. Я Марина. Ну, значит, имя у тебя уже есть. Будешь заботиться о лошадях, Марина. А я попытаюсь разыскать твоего отца. Хорошо. Weeks went by. My father was still part of a violent war machine. Was he perhaps already dead? Kozhel and his Cossacks were my only family now, my only anchor in this world. And I had but one purpose, to stay with them. I began to feel that I was part of a bigger army on our way south now through the Caucasus Mountains. А у меня есть подарок для хорошей девочки. Что это? Получишь, если угадаешь. Письмо? Нет. Мыло? Не будь глупенькой. Я знаю. Шашка. At that moment, I completely forgot about my father. For the first time in my life, I felt like an adult, and even a little dangerous. Спасибо, Козел. Черт побери. Пока я не умер, я сделаю из тебя настоящего казака. I practice with my saber every day. I struck it sharply against the trunk and held it up to my ear to listen to its vibrations. No tone at all. 
I struck it again. I kept striking. Marina. Я же... Ну, я же думал, ты будешь только играть. Боялся, что поранишься. Да пошел ты! Ну, хорошо, ты получишь настоящую шашку. Обещаю. A heroic charge on horseback with saber in hand is the long-standing ideal of the military elites in the East, just as in the West. The Germans massively expanded their cavalry units only a few years earlier. The French cuirassier advanced against the enemy in the summer of 1914 with lances and shiny gold helmets, just as in the medieval era. The British cavalrymen throw themselves into the slaughter in tight formation without regard for casualties. They're all swept away. Millions of horses in all armies. Their riders. And that romantic image of war, too. Those who survive dig themselves into the earth. When I saw the trenches for the first time, there was complete silence. No shooting, no calling, nothing. It felt like we were at the edge of a great volcano, and buried under the earth, there were thousands of men hiding there, ready to kill each other. Louis Bertas was born in 1879 in a village in southwestern France. He works as a barrel maker in the winemaking region of Minervois, is married, and has two sons. Louis Bertas is a member of a union and a pacifist at heart. But this war is about defending the French Republic from the German Empire. In Paris, political parties, even those normally hostile to each other, have formed the Union Sacrée, the sacred union against the Germans. The main objective is the quick recapture of those areas of northern France which have been conquered by the Germans. Trusting in their own offensive capabilities, the French army only builds provisional trenches. C'est toi Aguisol. <rire> J'ai peine à te reconnaître. Alban est là aussi. Alban Alban Louis ah J'arrive pas à croire qu'on se retrouve ici. Comment vous allez tous T'es comment là-bas Écoute bien, Louis. Tu fais tout comme nous sans poser de questions. Si on te demande de courir, tu cours. Si on rampe, tu rampes. Mais surtout, surtout si on te demande de courir. Là, ils vont coûter les grelots. C'est si terrible. C'est l'enfer, Louis. C'est l'enfer, Louis. On a inventé l'enfer sur Terre. Je pouvais lire sur leur visage. I could read it in their faces. The horror, the exhaustion, the hunger. And from today, it would be on my face as well. Death would be my constant companion. We spent hours in the mud. With horror, I noticed that my boots were completely soaked with ice-cold water. And we hadn't even reached our trenches yet, in which we were now to hold out for eight days and nights. We've been in the trenches for three weeks now. Now and then, artillery fire 
Some German snipers. Good morning, sir. Excuse me, sir. But mainly, we have been waiting. I can hardly imagine the ubiquitous muckiness, mud and stench of the whole front. That is the real enemy. Dose of trench fever. It isn't getting any better. Rather worse in these conditions. Should I really have insisted on serving in the trenches? After the heavy losses of the first battles, the generals focus on a new kind of warfare trench. Since the fall of 1914, entire labyrinths spring up behind the front lines. Digging trenches soon fills up most of the soldiers' lives. The devastating effects of shells and bullets are only survivable underground. For the soldiers, the trench becomes their new home. They come to terms with it as best they can. But even in the trenches, artillery fire or enemy snipers could mean death at any second. Just as bad are rats, dampness, and lice. Even in the quiet parts of the front, soldiers die every day from exhaustion and disease. I did not wash the entire time. One day, I was horrified to discover lice in my clothes. I was forced to go and explain my situation to Koja. The next morning, he took me along with him to a building on the outskirts of the village. It had a bathtub, my first bath in weeks. It looked like a mud pool before I got out of it. Strangely, it seems that the shorter my hair got, the less vulnerable I felt. I don't even think that the people from my village would recognize me. Humans get ever smaller compared to the gargantuan size of the fronts. Trenches cut through Belgium and France for over 700 kilometers, from the North Sea to the Swiss border. Because the trenches are dug in several rows, the entire system spans several thousand kilometers. The Eastern Front stretches from the Baltic almost to the Black Sea. It cuts through Lithuania, Poland, Galicia, and the Carpathians, through forests and swamps, steppes and mountains. In its entirety, the front is over 1,600 kilometers long. We dug the entire day, could hardly go on. The hunger was so painful, and we had to keep digging. There was no mercy. Thus, the days went by, always the same. Our food consisted of soup, a small piece of meat, and some black coffee, which only served to whet our appetite. We could have eaten ten times as much. Warum muss der Menage immer kalt bei uns ankommen? Immer! Chef. Irgendwas musst du halt essen. Ist wurscht was, aber ohne Essen geht's nicht. Los, 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 los! Ja, dann Frost fressen doch nicht einmal die Rotzen! Ach. The food arrives in the trench. It's been cold for a long time. The soup is a muddy stew. The bread only good for rats. And the coffee tastes like dishwater. One could not believe that we could hold on for so long, for I have never eaten such food in my life. In the morning, boiled water, which they call coffee, and always these yellow and white turnips, but which are so overcooked that our pigs at home wouldn't eat them. 
It's always half raw steaks of beef in a sauce that looks and smells like blood. I've become a vegetarian. I have performed abstention from what is unlawful. I have used nothing of this country to date except water and fruit. I am afraid of failing. Soldiers often have to defend their rations from rats. The daily wait for food, the communal cursing of quality and quantity, unites men of all nations in their trenches. Hardly anyone expected a long war. In earlier times, fighting would cease in winter because it wasn't possible to feed the soldiers. Now, a completely new supply train has to be created to supply millions of men at the front. Farmers who live near the front can sell their goods to the soldiers with huge profits. And yet, they are hated as war profiteers. Behind the front line, giant bakeries and distilleries are built. Hardly a soldier is able to face the horrors of war without the numbing effects of alcohol. And when it comes to cattle for the slaughter, the armies on both sides are truly insatiable. And so this is where I finally am, the trench of death. For the first time, the war shows its entire cruelty. Death is everywhere. Soldiers' knapsacks, shirts, clothes, flesh. Flies are already swarming around the corpses. Corpses were everywhere, ours and the enemy's. Some fresh, some days old, some intact, some not. Bodies which hadn't been buried deep enough stuck out of the ground. The wheels of my cannon ran over them. So for the first time I looked upon two dying men. Some of their blood was on my clothes. One died in half an hour, the other early next morning. Struggling free from the earth, I would pick up a body beside me to lift him out with me and find a decayed corpse. I pulled a head off and was covered in blood. Can you see something like this and not lose your mind? It would seem that you can. The thing we look forward to the most was the mail, cards, small packages. When and if it got here, it was often something for me. Wagner? Niemand? Nichts? Some of the letters were for soldiers who could no longer reply to their families. Many families of the fallen don't know where their loved ones were killed. Their suffering was over, and we had stuck them into the cold ground.
It sang like a choir of angels. Still, we should be glad you weren't caught by a bullet. Not even a scratch, sir. Bronchitis, temperature of 103, measles rash. Let that be enough, Montague. can't dispute the justice of it. For though I felt wholly young till I was burnt, I begin to feel an old crock. Out of place among the boys. Every evening watch duty in the front trench. They're expecting attacks. Sixty interminable hours without sleeping, in the wet, in the cold. I wonder when the inevitable rheumatism will set in. On these watch duties, you get all sorts of thoughts. Before the war, I felt like some people, down with the old establishment. It seems to me that culture and all great things are slowly being snuffed out by the war. The war has awoken in me a longing for the blessing of peace. I've heard that in the neighboring battalion some went mad from sleep deprivation. No wonder. Kein Wunder. Der Leutnant hat mir gerade bestätigt, dass die Kriegsgerichte für eine solche Schweinerei gleich zehn Jahre ausgeben. Zehn Jahre! Aber was nutzt uns das? Hier ist das Angebot des Herrn Leutnant. Sie werden alleine wohl bemerkt auf Erkundung geschickt. Klären Sie den Feind im Niemandsland auf. Schaffen Sie zwei Stunden. Lassen wir die Sache auf sich beruhen. Selbstverständlich, Herr Feldwebel. Zwei Stunden. Herr Kriegsfreiwilliger. Ernst Junger grew up in Hanover, Germany. He volunteered for the army in August 1914. At 19 years old, he's not so much swept up by national euphoria. Instead, he wants to escape an oppressive bourgeois life. With an emergency high school diploma in his pocket, he's transferred to the front near Verdun as a rank and file soldier. Like him, Tens of thousands of war volunteers signed up to fight in order to become heroes. Their enthusiasm and courage, along with their inexperience, mean a quick hero's death for many of them. The survivors have come to terms with being part of an entirely unheroic slaughter. For all I cared, they could have stood me directly in the French posts. What annoyed me was that common boy who said if something happens to Younger, it's only fair. When the soldiers leave their protective trenches, they have to cross a ghostly landscape which has never been seen before this war. No man's land. It can be as narrow as 10 meters or as wide as a thousand and only has one lord and master death itself. This horror zone is laced with an invention originally created to aid in herding cattle. Now, 
Barbed wire becomes a deadly trap for those daring to attack. Wounded, they become entangled in its sharp barbs and are thus easy pickings for the defending enemy. There is no hope for those who are wounded and left behind. There was a thick smell of corpses over all the more dangerous zones of this region. Moreover, this heavy and saccharine waft was not entirely inoffensive. Mixed with the acrid smog of explosives, it aroused a sense of clairvoyance which only the extreme proximity of death can produce. In that moment, I felt no fear but an intense, almost spirit-like weightlessness. And a surprising mood of laughter came over me, which I could not suppress. In the end, we are soldiers. Weapons are our tools. Our job is to kill, and it is our duty to do it well and see it through to the end. We see the enemy and that's enough. Our Welsh blood boils within us. And our bayonets flash as they bury themselves in German bodies. When it rains Russian blood and snows Italian heads, let us pray to the Lord that the weather doesn't change. I meant to murder, 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 so as to be at one with my surroundings, to feel more grounded and not so incredibly alone in this horror of war. I crawl to one of the trenches of the Huns and look over the parapet. A German soldier is standing there. He's talking and laughing. I slowly pull the trigger. He simply grunts and collapses. I've never felt so good, nor relished such an intense feeling. In that moment, we all become wild animals. All we think about is killing and massacring. I kneel, I shoot, he falls. I go to him. He is still alive. A bullet to his brains and it's all over. Equipped with new gargantuan armies, the generals of all major powers plan for massive offensives in the spring of 1915. The reality of a war that takes place in trenches and is dominated by defensive firepower hardly factors into their blueprints. Instead of new strategies, the generals want to defeat the enemy through sheer numbers. France plans its breakthrough at Artois, hoping to push the Germans back into their own country. Austria and Germany plan an equally ambitious breakthrough in Galicia to defeat the Russians once and for all. Great Britain prepares for a naval landing on the Gallipoli Peninsula. While Russia plans to push through the Caucasus, capturing the Turkish border. Brothers, officers invariably address their soldiers as men. Brothers, I watched the men anxiously. I had fully expected all of them to step forward as one. But no one moved. Kazakh. 
Ваше превосходительство, я пойду. Найду себе семерых добровольцев. А ребенок пусть останется здесь. Война все-таки мужское дело. Хорошо, казак. Возьми себе семерых. И эту девчонку тоже. Ваше превосходительство. Это приказ. It was not a far distance to the big bridge across the Arax River, which we were to blow up. My knees felt soft and weak. I had to clench my teeth to keep them from chattering. My heart was beating so fast. I was terribly afraid. держи голову прижатой к земле и делай все как я поняла, поняла. I would have given anything to crawl back then and there, but I was with Kozhil. I couldn't imagine anything really going wrong with him at my side. Les trois enfants, moi. Trois enfants. Ça suffit Oh, saisissez-vous Mon Dieu Vater, du führe mich. Führe mich zum Siege. Führe mich zum Tode. Herr, wie du willst, so führe mich. Punkt 2 Uhr hieß es zu Sturm. Die Order to attack the enemy was given. So, ihr erster Angriff, was? Jawohl, Herr Feldwebel. Dann pass mal schön auf, mein Junge. So, meine Herren, dann wollen wir mal. Angriff! Oh, no, Für Kaiser, Gott und Vaterland! When the order to attack is given, soldiers storm ahead in close ranks. They are led by officers who often only carry a pistol. Most attackers don't even make it to the enemy wire entanglements. They fall prey to a weapon that was perfected in World War I, the machine gun. It can fire up to 600 rounds per minute. The defenders operating it only have to keep feeding bullets and cooling the barrel. The machine gun's firepower is so enormous that it doesn't even have to be precisely aimed. Any attack thus becomes a suicide mission. 
На землю! Это пулеметчики, они нас раскрыли! Bullets whizzed over my head. They sounded like angry wasps. Joseph! Well, the wounded corporal was not doing too well. I kept saying that he would soon die. I couldn't bring myself to leave him. And I comforted him as best I could. Du hast das gut. Du kommst jetzt zu Hause, bei dir ist der Krieg vorbei. Richtig gut. Das schaut gar nicht so schlimm aus. Sind Sie verwundet? Ich glaube nicht. Ach nee, da kommt doch schon das Blut. Sie müssen zurück, 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 zurück. Thus fall men beside each other. It's a carnival from hell raging across the earth. Fellow after fellow, he who wavers will die. It was difficult for me to abandon him there, as I knew he would soon meet his end. Ich kann dich jetzt nicht zurückbringen. Sie zerschießen uns beide. Ich hole dich später. Ich ging weiter. I advanced. Denn so waren ja die Befehle. As I was ordered to do. I was hit by a bullet in the chest. I fell, and everything before my eyes went black. Instead of the decisive victory so desired by everyone, the spring battles of 1915 have but one result. 90,000 killed in the Caucasus. 60,000 killed at the Masurian Lakes. 190,000 killed in Galicia. 113,000 killed at Gallipoli. 90,000 killed in the Champagne. 20,000 killed in Flanders. 130,000 killed in... Allez, 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 There was hardly anyone left who could have attacked. Captain Udell's orders were explicit. As long as the unit still exists, men, it is to keep attacking. Without regard for casualty.
We had defeated one disease after the next. Modern medicine had given us health and hope. A man's existence was no longer confined solely to his work, nor that of women to childbearing. Science promised to deliver us heaven on earth, and we were happy to believe that. We had begun to live, and our children would have it even better. This is something we were sure of, until the summer of 1914. We, for our part, were military and bandaged little messenger boys in the park. And where's your wife, young soldier? I do believe we all felt like doing our bit. The messenger boys' wounds were always conveniently placed, and they never screamed and writhed or prayed for morphia when they were being bandaged. And shoulders were not shot away, nor eyes blinded or men's faces mushed. The war has been raging for seven months now, on the battlefields of Flanders and Galicia, in the canyons of Carpathia and the Caucasus, in the jungles of East Africa and the deserts of Mesopotamia. No victory is forthcoming and the number of casualties far exceeds anything thinkable before the war. Am Morgen wird dieser Waggon als provisorische Rote Kreuzstation die verwundeten Züge von der Front mit Kaffee und Suppe versorgen. Ihr bekommt diese Armbinden, tragt sie die ganze Zeit. Der Bahnhof ist Sperrgebiet. Und bereitet euch auf das Schlimmste vor. At the outbreak of the war, we thought that the many beds in the hospital would never be filled up. Now, however, we don't have enough of them. We don't have enough of them, nor sheets or pillows. How long will this war go on for? A few weeks ago, we still believed until Christmas. Maybe it will only end when we're all dead. Alfreda Kuhr is 13 years old and lives in Schnademühl in the province of Posen in the eastern part of Germany. The city's train station is turned into a Red Cross station in the spring of 1915. Alfreda's grandmother is in charge of the small group of volunteer nurses. Schnademühl has become an important rail junction for the troops on their way to the Eastern Front. The soldiers sing as they go to war. There is, however, no singing on the trains that return home. Auf diesen einen Fräulein-Kur, dann können Sie sich ausruhen. Ich kenne keine Pause, solange noch ein deutscher Kriegsheld verwundet auf dem Schlachtfeld liegt. Was machst du da? Großmutter, du musst liegen bleiben. Deine beiden Beine sind zerschossen. Oh, Elfriede. Ich habe für solche Spielereien wirklich keine Zeit. Das ist kein Spiel. Ich übe für den Tag, an dem ich als Rotkreuzschwester an die Front muss. Du bist 13 Jahre alt. Ja, aber in ein paar Jahren sind alle Krankenschwestern tot. Und dann brauchen sie mich. Before the war, the Germans estimated that about 17,000 nurses would be needed. After a few months of fighting, they find that 10 times this number are required. The situation is similar in Britain. A desire to make patriotic sacrifices, however, impels thousands of women to volunteer as nurses. 
They want to do their bit, just like their menfolk, and assert their own right to serve their country. Not by taking lives, but by saving them. Now, what would the gash of a saber look like? Would it cut through the middle of the face? No, the face must surely be preserved. Perhaps a slice through the shoulder. It's difficult to not take ready. Stay. We did not pretend to be ready, but we meant to fight whether we were ready or not. Also, we meant to go on fighting till the end. The war was a matter of national honor. Even though Englishmen do not feel hate, they very often feel rage. My, my, I'm terribly excited. They're going to take care of all these men. Bandage, wash... Most importantly, we must smile. All of you must maintain your smile. I call it the patent patriotic smile. It looks somewhat like this. You must learn to carry it in all situations. It will keep up the men's courage. No doubt we should start there. Sarah McNaughton was born in 1864 into a wealthy Scottish family. Like many single, upper-class women, she is passionate about charity work and wants to use her inheritance for worthwhile aims. As a Red Cross volunteer, she has already experienced the wars in South Africa and in the Balkans. So for Sarah McNaughton, reporting for duty as a volunteer nurse on the Belgian front is an obvious decision. Traveling with her are a group of inexperienced young women who also want to assist the British Army in the most brutal conflict it has ever faced. Dr. Henry Beavis, and you've been assigned to me. Sarah McNaughton, sir. Our outfit is complete. All the women of our group are prepared to partake in the toughest of tasks to aid the wounded. The wounded? My dear ladies, what do you expect you'll be doing? Forgive me, Dr. Beavis. I can assure you that with my experience in the South African And war, I can assure you this is no mere skirmish with a couple of natives. Cooking, cleaning and food distribution are precisely the tough tasks you can look forward to. Shall we? Even though I feel sorry for the wounded, my Russian heart beats with pride at the thought that I will soon be there with them. When our Japanese delegation arrived in Liverpool, I asked the interpreter to express my feelings, that I was proud to be a member of the Red Cross. It is very nice to be addressed as nurse and sister. It appeals to me very much. I hear dozens of war stories, as it is, and if I wished, I could hear hundreds. From now on, I wore the dress of the Russian St. George's sisters. I yearned to do good, and I did not have to wait long before I saw the first of the Russian wounded. Finally, we can hear the cannons. Our hearts quiver. The danger is intoxicating. The volunteer nurses follow the soldiers to the front with idealism. But their training is brief, and their conception of the war often naive and heavily influenced by propaganda. Initially, the experienced field doctors are highly skeptical about this surge of female helpers and forbid them from carrying out any real medical duties. They are not even allowed to change bandages. Instead, they're confined to more menial tasks, 
washing bandages, and preparing the incredible amount of material required for dressings. Many hospital trains now stop at the station. There is always a quietness around these trains. Sometimes, a couple of lightly wounded men stagger out and ask for a refreshment. Then we heard some ghastly, inhuman howling. So terrifying. I didn't know that a human could scream this way, like an animal brought to the slaughter. Then it's then endlich Schluss mit dem Krieg. Wenn wir gesiegt haben, Herzenskind. Und wenn wir nicht siegen? Dann hilf uns Gott. Aber das ist unmöglich. All my previous ideas of men marching to war had a touch of. Heroism, <laughs> crudely expressed by quick step, smart uniforms. Today I see men so broken that their own mothers would hardly recognize them. And the uniforms are stiff with blood and have to be cut off. The wounded are collected in the courtyard. They carry labels, the names, regiment numbers, and the types of wounds they have. You're here to ensure the men have something to drink. Fetch yourselves a handcart. I want to see tea, coffee, and water here at all times. Understood? The sheer volume and severity of the injuries makes it impossible to treat everyone wounded in battle. A new method was systematically applied for the first time, triage. After only a few seconds of assessment, doctors decide between life and death. The wounded are divided into one of three categories and given labels accordingly. The lightly wounded are hastily bandaged and sent back to their units. Those with serious injuries are sent for treatment in hospitals just behind the front line. Those for whom there is no hope receive no treatment. They are just left to die. Oh, you'll get used to it. Germans don't normally fire at us, but we're so close to the front, you never know your look. All right, follow me. The first sound of shells is unexpected and a little startling. It was a curious sound of rending, increasing in violence as the missile comes toward one, giving one plenty of time to wonder whether it intends to hit one or not. My pulse throbbed in my ears. My head was heavy. Somewhere beneath it was pain, not attached to it at all, but floating around beneath it as chaos floats beneath the world. My mind was a blank. It did not seem to have any thoughts. Marina Yurlova is barely 15 years old when she's wounded in battle. She ran away from her home a few months before and became a child soldier, the only girl in a unit of Cossacks. Opposing them are the troops of the Ottoman Empire. The Turks and the Russians have been fighting for control of the Caucasus Mountains for six months. The battles in the remote mountain passes on the edge of Europe claim hundreds of lives every single day. The number of wounded is beyond count. And then it all came back. But he was dead. But keep dead. But keep dead. I was alone with my aching body, and I cursed it for being alive when it should have died at the bridge with him.
At 1,500 kilometers, the Caucasus Front is twice the length of the Western Front in France and Belgium. And there are hardly any streets or train tracks. Extremely long marches, often for hundreds of kilometers, as well as the biting cold and bloody battles, wear out the soldiers. But the Russian army has orders to conquer the entire Caucasus region. Air, stank of blood. I looked around me. There was nothing to see but cart after cart of the wounded in every imaginable state of agony. The world was full of torn and broken men. I began to cry for my mother's hands, the warmest hands in the world, and for her gentle voice. I was furious that they should give me such companions, men who had not been wounded in the same battle as myself, or even in any battle, and who were too repulsive for pity, and too far gone for conversation. I prayed that the man next to me would die. But he did not. When I heard this, I became very worried that the dying man had heard it too. You simply cannot tell a young man who is so eager to live that he doesn't have the smallest crumb of hope. Keine Spur, Großmutterchen. Es geht ihm ja schon viel besser. Und du meinst mein Kindchen? One day, a boy of 18 asked me to write a comforting letter to his mother. I was to tell her that he was all right to comfort her. I wrote the letter. He died shortly after. He said, sister, am I going to die? He looked at me suspiciously, and I remembered that the soldiers called the doctors the helpers of death. I leaned down to him and said, of course not, comrade. I accompanied him as the orderlies carried him down the ramp, and I told him to get well soon. Goodbye, I said. He raised his head, wanted to say something, but he could not speak. We would never meet again. I realized that in his delirium, he had mistaken me for the girl he loved. I bent and kissed his damp, hot face, and he became more tranquil. Death claimed him while he was still in a state of tranquility. Волонтер Марина Юрлова. Я была ранена в ногу. Так, давай посмотрим. Когда он снял повязку, when he took the bandages off my leg, I looked at the wound. If you like to be my whole leg was swollen to three times its normal size and had turned black. Голубой черный. Где она по всей ноге? Надо срочно ампутировать, если ты вообще выкарабкаешься. Ампутировать. 
Amputate. Amputate. What was he saying? Did he mean they would have to cut off my leg? Amputation. The cutting off of arms or legs is still the preferred method for dealing with large wounds. Thus, it has been on battlefields for centuries. But compared to earlier wars, the wounded now have a decent chance of survival. Painkillers and disinfectants make even more amputations possible. I did my leg off, never to ride again, never to go back to the army, never to run. Never should I get home again, to climb the hills, never to play, never to dance. One in two soldiers manages to survive an amputation. Soon, there are millions of men with missing arms and legs. This spawns a whole new industry in order to create enough artificial limbs. According to the propaganda, these amputees, thanks to the latest technology, are almost to be envied. Promotional films showcase amputees using their highly practical work hands and their more attractive Sunday hands for use in leisure time. But what it really means to have to live without a limb remains taboo. Dear mother, this looks like child's writing as I'm writing with my left hand. I suppose you know by this time that I've lost my right arm. However, I am getting along fine. They have cut off the whole of one leg, and one hand is now useless. They have given me a leg, but it is made of wood and it is vile. There is nothing left of me. Shortly after my left leg had been taken away, I felt a sharp pain in that very leg. Night after night, I awoke with this pain and had to touch my bandages to make certain that the leg was no longer there. My left leg was amputated, and I required even more surgery. I was being cut away, piece by piece, and I no longer had the strength to carry on. Don't lose your senses. Don't look again. The odor of anesthetic sweet and deadly drifted in and out of my thoughts. I knew that I could not escape from this place, from the knife, from the raw stump they were going to make of my leg. I think I have seen too much pain lately. I now live from five o'clock in an atmosphere of bandages and blood. Blood-stained mattresses and pillows are carried out into the courtyard. There is always a pile of bandages and rags being burned, and the youth stirs the horrible pile with a stick. A queer smell permeates everything. The guns never cease. Everyone! The main entrance! Nurses, orderlies, all personnel! A few hours earlier, on the 22nd of April, 1915, just a few kilometers away, German troops commenced an attack that would change the nature of armed conflict once and for all. This was the first use of deadly poison gas in history. Within an hour, hundreds of Canadian, 
British and French soldiers were dead. Thousands more fled with their lungs dissolving. They're suffocating, Sarah. The men are simply suffocating. Calm down now. A lady never gives in to pure desperation. You know that. It's a type of a asphyxiating gas. There are hundreds, thousands out there waiting for help. I have no idea what we should do. The asphyxiating gas seems to have been simply diabolical. Unless one had actually seen the immediate result, one could hardly have credited it. The vast rooms echoed to the cries of pain. The Belgian town of Ypres becomes a tragic symbol of this new war of poison gas. But this new weapon would soon be employed far beyond Flanders. The most terrible losses are in the east, where the Russian soldiers have no way to protect themselves when exposed to German chlorine gas. The British and the French quickly develop their own deadly gases. Soon, every attack on the fronts in Belgium and France is accompanied by a cloud of poison gas. The main objective of this weapon is not to kill, so much as to terrorize. Our eyes are filled with tears. We wipe them away, but they just keep coming because the shells are loaded with gas. We pray to our Lord God to save us from this for just one more day. They cannot swallow. Their burnt and swollen tongues cannot move inside their mouths. It's as if something was strangling them. It sounds like a death rattle. The spring scent of hawthorn fills the air. Suddenly, I realize what this smell is. I feel my eyes burning and they start tearing up. I cannot believe that this scent of spring is actually deadly gas. Poor survivors. They only live to die later on. A horribly slow death in excruciating pain. The air was ripe with the smell of chlorine. I don't know what you're bringing, Miss McNaughton, but it certainly isn't coffee. No, Dr. Beavers. This is good Scotch whiskey. I bought it myself. It's for the men. I thought that mixed with water, it might help soothe them, strengthen their organism, and most importantly, help them sleep. What can I say? Can't do any harm, poor boogers. Scott, I can assure you, a little whiskey always helps. What on earth is this? Are we on the edge of a volcano? The trench fills with flames, sparks, acrid smoke. You can't breathe. I had just felt the breath of death. Some people say it is cold. I found it hot. Louis Bartas is 36 years old and a corporal in the French army. Before August of 1914, such a career would have been unthinkable for Bartas, who is a confirmed pacifist. But after almost a year of war, France has long since mobilized all reservists. They manned the trenches, which stretch for thousands of kilometers across the land. Both sides experiment with ever new weapons in order to break the stalemate of the trenches. Soldiers especially fear liquid fire, the flamethrower. Ah, Bartas, qu'est-ce qu'ils ont vos yeux? Ça va mieux, capitaine. Où est votre arme? 
Nom de Dieu, allez chercher votre fusil. Oui, mon capitaine. On tient la tranchée. Vous m'avez compris Oui, mon capitaine. In his madness, he was singing songs from his childhood. Speaking to his wife, his mother. Captain! Captain Udell! Captain! These huge numbers of wounded and crippled soldiers are no coincidence, but a deliberate military strategy. The horrific injuries caused by poison gas, flamethrowers, or shrapnel shells create panic and weaken the enemy's morale. Weapons are increasingly developed in order to incapacitate rather than to kill enemy soldiers. The reason for this is that a wounded soldier who has to be cared for ties up far more of the enemy's resources and accordingly costs a lot more than a dead one. Je vais l'emmener au poste de secours, capitaine. Pas question. J'ai des ordres. Et je suis prêt à battre le premier qui tentera de quitter la tranchée. C'est pire qu'un meurtre Laissez crever ce pauvre diable dans la boue Les généraux devraient venir voir un peu ce qui se rame ici. Ça leur remettrait les idées en place. Vous voyez bien que c'est déjà un cadavre Ils n'en voudront même pas au poste de secours Bon, les gars, retournez à vos postes, je vais rester ici. Retournez à vos postes. Allez Je m'en occupe, capitaine. J'ai dormi en train de mort. I slept between a dead man and a soldier in agony, but the heart loses its sensitivity. Parce qu'il a subi d'épreuves, le cœur perd toute sensibilité. We dosed the men. It seemed to do them a wonderful lot of good. And in some way acted as an antidote to the poison. Also, it pulled them together. And they got some sleep afterwards. beds filled with men in pain give one something to think about and it's during pain that these attitudes of suffering strike one most some of them bury their heads in their pillows like shot partridges seek to bury theirs in autumn leaves <laughs> The stretcher I was on was placed in a cold, dark room filled with soldiers, also lying on stretchers for beds. The orderlies were so eager to leave that they did not take time even to bid me good night or good luck. We were alone. Nessuno si occupava di noi. No one was taking care of us. Il silenzio cresceva dentro in quell'oscurità. 
The silence grew Eu ominous in the dark. My fever was getting worse. Vincenzo d'Aquila was born in 1893 in Palermo in Sicily. Shortly after his birth, his family emigrated to the New World, to New York. America was the new home for millions of Italian immigrants. But many never lost their emotional attachment to their former homeland. When Italy entered the war on the side of France and Britain in the spring of 1915, many Italian Americans felt the call to serve their distant homeland. Volunteers full of romantic ideals embarked for Europe in their thousands and soon found themselves face to face with the realities of trench warfare. Hey, company. How are you that? Ma questo mica è morto! Mio figlio! All'improvviso capì che c'era qualcosa che non andava. Immediately, I knew that there was something wrong. Solo in quel momento, realizzai che questo posto... I realized that this was the hospital morgue. E che tutti gli uomini... And that the occupants on the stretchers were corpses. Non altro che cadaveri. Ecco perché quella stanza era così fredda. That was why the room was so cold and so quiet. Venite qui! Questo cadavere parla! Questo era morto, ha aperto gli occhi. Mi ha chiamato. All'improvviso. All of a sudden, a whole platoon of doctors and nurses now came running to investigate my resurrection from the dead. On paper, the Kingdom of Italy had been allied with Austria-Hungary. But in May 1915, Italy declared war on their neighbors and ordered their own troops to advance. The government in Rome expected the weakened Habsburg Empire to be a pushover. Instead, the war brings the inexperienced Italian soldiers into one of the most hostile environments on the continent, the Alps. Italy is intent on conquest. Their official reason for war, the Italian-speaking minorities in South Tyrol and Trentino. The Italians' right to these two provinces has been guaranteed in a secret treaty with their new allies in Paris and London. The Italians attack on two fronts simultaneously, in the Dolomites and across the river Isonzo, which forms the border. The Austrians mobilize their last reserves and halt the advance, but at great human cost to both sides. Battle wounds are only part of the soldiers' suffering. Cold and lack of hygiene take almost as heavy a toll as the enemy bullets. Typhoid fever is especially feared. If the brain is affected by the infection, delusions and death may follow. The war is finished. The war is finished. The war is finished. The war is finished. Bentornato, amico americano. Sei stato nove giorni in coma. Ma io ero lì. Tutti i soldati hanno gettato le armi. La guerra è finita. È il delirio per la febbre. Guarda intorno, poveri diavoli. Loro non stanno mica meglio. La metà di loro sopravvive. L'altra metà... Oh, sei stato fortunato. Mi hanno colpito. Ma io sono immortale. Le pallottole non possono più farmi del male. Tutti i soldati avevano il fucile puntato su di me, ma poi hanno smesso di spararmi. Guarda la ferita. Guarda. Ma deve esserci da qualche parte fratello, la ferita, guarda. Fratello, non puoi far fermare la guerra con un sogno. La guerra non è finita. No. Non è finita.
Я уже умерла. Я на небесах. Ну, чтобы наш бакинский госпиталь вдруг оказался на небесах, такого я пока не слышал. Что с моей ногой? Смотри сама. О боже, она на месте. Я нашел пулю и достал ее. Спасибо вам, доктор. Ты очень сильная девочка. Смотри, как ты боролась. Даже под действием наркоза. Но если бы ты так не сражалась, тебя было бы на одну ногу меньше. Я могу вернуться в армию? Детка, неужели ты все еще хочешь Я на меня? детка. Я казак. И в конце концов мы еще не победили. Кафе, бит ангкоршу. Alors Il est en train de mourir. Dieu merci. Et moi alors Vous me donnez rien. Comment était-ce possible we had expected him to die at any moment, and we were going to throw him out of the trench. And now he was demanding his coffee. It seemed to do him some good. But it seemed to do him some good. Alban, tu vas y aller avec Gustave. Allez, les gars. Je n'ai jamais su ce que ça veut dire. Je ne sais pas ce qui s'est passé de lui. Dans l'automne de 1915, des nouvelles offensives sont lancées. L'Italie pousse ses soldats forward dans une troisième et quatrième bataille sur le Isonzo River. The Germans and Austrians attack the Russians along a wide front in Poland. The intention of the French and British is to break through the German trenches in northern France and Belgium by the winter. They should have been back hours ago to pick us up. It looks like they have forgotten us, my dear. But the severe cases are still here. And us? Here we found the wounded all yelling like mad things, thinking they were going to be left behind. We shan't be able to leave now. Let us take all the wounded down to the coke cellar. Vads? Surely we're not going to run away from these ghastly German shells, now are we? This assurance that we did not mean to desert them seemed to bring a curious sense of safety to the men, as if a handful of women could protect them from bursting shells. A military order came that all those who could walk were to leave, so they set out. And that was a pathetic and ghastly business. But we still had to determine how the untransportables could best be cared for. Not a man remained with us. Our staff consisted solely of women. I do not fancy this small coal cellar gave any protection whatever. And there was always the chance that the building above might collapse and fall on top of us. But that was one of the chances which had to be accepted. And the fact of being in any sort of cellar had a certain pretension of safety about it, which satisfied the men. I will never forget the terrible devastation and waste of human life. 
Men and boys brought by ambulance covered in a mixture of mud and blood, many of them dying of their injuries. We pull off the blanket and observe that this is a man. He makes feeble whining noises like an animal. He lies still and smells bad. He smells like a corpse. And this is the place where he's to be mended? It did not bother me to see their wounds. The look in their faces was far worse. I saw fear there, fear of what was waiting for them, fear of what they had experienced. There was no enthusiasm in their young faces. These faces appeared in my dreams too. They robbed me of sleep. We had to console, distract, and encourage those who on each of the 30 beds in the room lay there, suffering for France. We had to laugh and smile for 12 hours during the day, but in the evening in our dormitory, we wept. After seeing some of the dreadful things I have seen here, I feel I shall never be the same person again, and wonder if, when the war does end, I shall have forgotten how to laugh. I wished I had never been born. We sat in the cellar with one night light burning and with 70 wounded men to take care of. Two of them were dying. There was only one line of bricks between us and the shells. Now they came over at a rate of four a minute. Still we all smiled and made little jokes. Well now, who can still give me a patent patriotic smile? Well, not with all the men I had on top of me today. <laughs> I found myself wishing that for me, a shot would come and finish the horrible thing. We sat there all night. Una notte, decisi di fare qualcosa. One night, I suddenly needed to do something. It was as if the Holy Spirit had taken possession of me, lit me on fire. I was exalted. God was in me. I went to the sick, laid my hands on them, and stared them straight in the eyes. Non hai più la febbre da settimane, dai! Ma posso guarirle tutte? Sono troppo utile per tornare a fronte! Guarda che se non fossi stato americano ti avrebbero già portato via da un pezzo. Portarmi via? Da farmi venire a prendere, portarmi a giro per il paese, presentarmi come miracolato e lasciarmi guarire la gente? No, per metterti al muro e farti fuori. For many doctors, the war is a great opportunity. A formidable laboratory for the study of afflictions. Blood transfusions, anesthetics, and other revolutionary therapies are developed. Never before have the chances of recovery, even in apparently hopeless cases, been so high. But the doctors are not just there to help their patients. They also have power over them. Accordingly, the soldiers are given intensive treatment in order to send them back to the front as soon as possible, or at least to a munitions factory. Anyone who can no longer contribute to the fight is weeded out. Potete anche spararmi. Ma tanto non lo fate perché sono americano, volontario e sono un guaritore miracolato. Ho raccontato loro che sei il figlio dell'ambasciatore americano. Eh, nessuno ti fucilerà. Però non puoi più restare qui. Mi sta facendo impazzire tutte queste persone coraggiose che non vedono mai tornare a fronte. Mm? Buona fortuna, amico mio. In realtà, 
Vieni a follia. Non la vado. La vado, no. Allora, andiamo. Aspetta. La vado, no, non ci vado. La vado. Sul foglio di trasferimento. Sul transfer paper, it was written. Caporale Vincenzo Dario. Caporal Vincenzo D'Aquila, committed for observation and confinement in the Civil Provincial Mental Institution of Udine. Typical manic symptoms, dangerous to himself and to others. E per gli altri. In 1913, a new dance from Argentina conquered the whole world. Nothing so passionate and scandalous as the tango had ever been danced before. Our stiff clothing and corsets stopped us from partying, so we took them off. We rediscovered our bodies and carnal desire. We got married for love and chose our own husbands and wives. That was hardly the case for our grandparents and parents. We sought fulfillment not just in heaven, but on earth too. Till death do us part was how we promised ourselves. We thought that was romantic. Until the summer of 1914. Pas le monde à moi. 
Je suis tout à fait. Paul, my love, I am yours now and always. Je rêve si souvent de tes bras. How often I dream of being in your arms. Je nous vois ensemble. Close to your body. Rien ne nous résiste. Plus rien ne nous We empêche de do the most beautiful things together. Quand ces rêves s'évanouissent, je me sens terriblement seule. But when I wake up, I feel so sad and so alone. Quand allons-nous enfin? When will we finally be together? Oh Paul, oh, Paul. Mm. loving Paul. J'aimerais tant te donner un I want so to make you happy and take you to paradise. Everything has been shattered. My life as a mother is now behind me. Berlin artist Kathy Kollwitz is a mother in mourning. In August 1914, she had pressured her husband to give his permission for their son Peter to go to war. The 18-year-old was killed by a bullet in Flanders just four days after he'd reached the front. His cross is one of hundreds of thousands in the countless military cemeteries across the combat zones of Belgium and northern France. Silent witnesses of this great slaughter. The burden of loss weighs heavily on those who live. Wenn du nur zornig wärst, mich hassen würdest, alles und nicht diese ständige, diese unmännliche Güte. Du hast dich selbst schon genug. Wir sind nicht besser geworden durch seinen Tod. Ich darf nicht dieselbe bleiben, ich darf nicht. Das bin ich unserem Peter schuldig. Du musst weiterleben. Das bist du schuldig. Manchmal vergesse ich, wie seine Augen aussahen, seine, seine Lippen. Ich muss mich erinnern. Geliebter, geliebter Junge. My boy, I loved you so terribly much. But sometimes you're simply not there. You stand somewhere in the dark and it's as though you were looking at me in an unfriendly way. It can only mean that I'm not thinking of you the way I should. My heart is full of tears all the time. But I am only one of a million of other sad mothers. I want no Victoria Cross. I want my son. I cannot be without my husband. I'm begging every night and day, for God's sake, send my husband to us. We have no place to go, but when my husband is here, we always have a place to go. The only way that I can imagine loving you more than I do is if we were together. Instead, you're far away. God has separated us. These days, I am dead inside. I have no heart, no feelings, no faith, no hope. I have nothing, just a dreadful emptiness. My love was taken for France. How did my heart consent to let him leave? My mind was steadfast in its fidelity. Now my soul refuses to let him go. Allez, fini de rêver. Sors de ton lit, il est déjà 6 heures. C'est bien beau de flémarder. Il y a du travail. Aujourd'hui, c'est jour de lessive, t'as oublié Papa, si je lave cette chemise, j'effacerai son odeur. Papa 24-year-old Marie and her husband Paul Pirot can't stand being parted. Shortly after they were married, Paul went off to war. Marie's only consolation is her correspondence with Paul. The young couple send letters to each other daily. Marie and Paul come from a tiny village in the Dordogne, 300 kilometers southwest of Paris. Marie's family own a farm there, and the income is just enough for them to get by. In the summer of 1915, while the men are fighting in northern France against the Germans, it's the women and old men who have to cope with the work in the fields. 
On ne s'est pas vu depuis huit mois. We haven't seen each other for eight months. Eight months. That's 241 days. Je m'en vais retrouver Paul. Il me l'a demandé. Une femme doit obéir à son mari, non Tu veux aller au front T'as donc perdu la tête Et qui c'est qui va faire ton travail Je veux tellement un enfant. Tant que tu vis sous mon toit, c'est moi qui décide. Je me suis jamais sentie aussi déchirée. I have never Mais felt so colère. divided, nor so angry with my father. Ce serait trop dangereux de partir là-bas. He claims it is too dangerous to go there. Quand je t'aurais donné un petit fils, tu ne traiteras plus comme ça. This month's long separation of men from their women is the result of the cold logic of French army policy. No home leave has been granted to their soldiers since the war began. The only way around this is a clandestine rendezvous behind the lines, but of course, that too is forbidden. For most men, all they have is unfulfilled desire. Women, it is feared, would undermine the morale of the troops. The soldiers' virility might be diverted from waging war. Any infringements are a matter for the military court. Nothing must deter the army from its sole objective, as envisioned by the general command, namely to fight and to kill. Mon cher Paul, tu écris que je ne veux pas. My dearest Paul, you have written that I did not want to see you because you are dirty and covered with mud. Je peux t'assurer que ce n'est pas. But I can assure you that it isn't the dirt that prevents me from taking you in my arms. I'm so terribly angry with myself for being so weak and not daring to contradict my father. Secretly, I'm preparing my things every day. And as soon as my father doesn't need me, I will come to caress you, my beloved Paul. My dear boy, I loved you so much. To die for the fatherland, it is so easily said. What a terrible tragedy. It is a triumph of hell which hides behind the gleaming mask of these words. I mean, the great experience of this whole war is quite simply death. Meaningless, and yet also necessary, unwanted, and yet freely chosen. I want to honor you with a memorial. I want to see the death of all you young volunteers incarnated in your figure. It should be cast in iron or bronze. And last forever. After a year of war, death has become commonplace. And yet these millions of victims have not led to any decisive military outcome. At the beginning of the war, propaganda tended to focus on portraying the enemy as an inhuman beast. Now, it's more about giving a meaning to the deaths of our boys. Because for the women at home, the loss of their husbands and sons is almost unbearable. The hero's death is turned into a product that can be mass produced. It's so frustrating not to be a man. What use is it being a child during times of war? One needs to be a soldier. I would make a good soldier. This is my, this is my albatross doppeldecker. I, Lieutenant von Jelinek, am flying higher and higher, drawing circles and under attack from enemy pilots. I usually win. Sometimes I shake so much that I fall down, along with the piled-up benches. Elfrida Kur was born in 1902 and lives in the province of Posen in the eastern part of Germany. Since the war began, she has been keeping a diary. 
Her hometown of Schnademühl is an important center for the armaments industry. Each month, the Albatross Works produces 100 fighter and bomber planes. Since 1915, Army officers are being trained to fly here in the pilot replacement unit. These young aviators are the new idols of this war. Ein todesmutiger Flieger, mein Fräulein. Das ist doch kein Fräulein. Das ist der Herr Leutnant von Jelinek. Geht hier auf, das ist peinlich. Ich bin Werner Waldecker und ich bin aus Bielefeld. Und ein echter Leutnant. Na, dann wollen wir mal. Das verschluckt mich. I was speechless. I couldn't reply. I just stared at him stupidly. I must have looked so unimaginably foolish. Ich fliege einen Albatross-Doppeldecker. Ich auch. Meiner heißt Flo. Dann sollten wir vielleicht mal ein wenig fachsimpeln. Was halten Sie von der Konditorei Fliegner? Ich habe aber kein Geld dafür. Das ist ein wahres Glück. Geld habe ich genug, aber Ihre Begleitung fehlt mir. Morgen Nachmittag? Meine Damen. Millions of young men all around the world have been drawn into the war. Battles make up only a small part of their war experience. The soldiers travel from place to place, from country to country, from continent to continent, with an unprecedented mobility. For many of these young men, this is the first time they've been free from parental influence. Their supervising officers find it difficult to constantly control their soldiers by enforcing the rules and regulations. The opportunities to get to know women and to forge new relationships grow ever greater the longer the war lasts. For many women and girls, it is easier than ever to get to know new men compared to before the war. Wissen Sie, dass ich jetzt auch zu den großen Mädchen gehöre? Weil Sie einen Windbeutel essen? Nein, weil ich jetzt auch einen Leutnant habe. Alle großen Mädchen haben einen. Doch die meisten. Sehen Sie, wir werden in ein paar Wochen ohnehin alle tot sein. Also versuchen wir das Leben zu genießen. Verstehen Sie das? Ich zum Beispiel. Ich habe noch nie Schnaps getrunken. <lacht> Schnaps habe ich schon gekostet. Würden Sie mit mir in den Himmel fliegen wollen? Eigentlich mag ich Pferde lieber als Flugzeuge. Pferde? Und auch lieber als Flieger? Pferde sind die besseren Menschen. Sie sind das komischste Mädchen, das mir je über den Weg gelaufen ist. Also Sie sind mir über den Weg gelaufen. Und außerdem muss ich jetzt nach Hause. Schade. Er stirbt schon gerne. Who could die so readily? He should taste what life has to offer. And besides that, he has blue eyes and smooth blonde hair. He also talked about his mother. Schade. Even in the years before the war, bourgeois morality has become more fragile. The Great War accelerates the erosion of long-standing customs and manners. Marriage is still regarded as a sacred covenant, but infidelity is increasingly common, and more and more illegitimate children are being born. The soldiers are aware that they may be dead in just a few days, and no longer feel so bound by bourgeois morality. Many recruits are stricken by a panic that they might die without losing their virginity. But whatever the men at the front may take for granted for themselves, this behavior is not tolerated in any way for their wives at home. If soldiers' wives are caught in bed with another man, the state ceases all support for them. In England, 
there are even uniformed women patrols to ensure that standards of public decency are upheld in the local streets and squares. Insecurity and jealousy must not be allowed to affect the fighting troops. But this is a futile endeavor. I hope you don't wear trousers on your job, sweetheart. I think it's so disgusting. And you know what the other lads will have of it. Don't ever let me see you in them, otherwise I shall pull them off you. The photo you sent me would have made me even happier if you had not allowed your picture to be taken with your shoulders so bare. It is not customary in my family for women to follow the liberal whims of fashion. Jealousy crowds my heart. Jealousy not born of mistrust, but of envy that others get to enjoy your company. While I, for whom this means joy and happiness, must now be so far away. How did you turn into a careless little girl who dances and flirts with strangers in a bar at night, while I am fighting at the front? In my dreams, I saw you with another man. It was unbearable. Marie, promise me that you will never be with anyone else. Even if he could give you more than I can. Even if I were to die. Never. Jamais. <laughs> J'ai pensé à ton voyage, moi aussi. Il te faudra au moins une semaine avant de le rejoindre, ton Paul. Une semaine à croiser des inconnus dans, dans les hôtels, dans les trains, partout. Papa, je suis pas une putain. Eh bah, t'irais expliquer ça aux autres. Mais bon Dieu Est-ce que t'as une idée de ce qui se passe là-dedans Allez, donne-moi ça. Oh. Oh. Ah. Ach, Mädel, so ein wunderschönes Haar. Ob ich es vielleicht mal ganz offen sehen kann? Auf Wiedersehen. Natürlich hätte ich... Of course, I could quite gladly have let Lieutenant Waldecker kiss me. Sehr gerne. Very gladly. Ich war eine... I was such a silly goose. Achtung! C'est moi qui veux apprendre de toi. Parle avec moi. Parle avec moi. C'est mieux que de lire Rambo. <rire> Rambo. Ah, monsieur le lieutenant est bien cultivé, hein. Même si c'est qu'un barbare d'allemand. Admets-le. Tu l'aimes tout, papa. Non, je le déteste. <rire> Pour Ernst Younger, who was born in 1895, war is a chance to make something of his life. At just 20 years old, he is promoted to lieutenant. The immense losses amongst the regular army officers makes this meteoric rise from the ranks possible. Younger belongs to a generation of young volunteers who have learned to kill before having learned to love a woman. Every few weeks or so, the troops are permitted a period behind the lines to rest from the fighting. Many French people remained in these German-occupied villages. Complex relationships develop between these people and their occupiers, ranging from resistance to collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> C'est un jeu étrange, au coin de joie. Ça s'appelle la guerre. Peut-être que ton papa va me tuer. Peut-être que c'est moi qui veux le tuer. Mais attends, maman. 
Il n'arrêtera rien. Alors j'espère que c'est mon père qui va te tuer Viens Qui veux-tu davantage pleurer Moi Ou papa Je pleure pas si facilement. Little by little, the French who have stayed behind and the occupying forces come to terms with each other. The Germans bring money, work, and the hope of some attention. Lonely women and foreign soldiers are united by their desire to escape for a few hours at least the cruel reality of war. Romantic relationships between French women and German soldiers are very much frowned upon. According to French public opinion, love for the enemy is seen as a betrayal. For the German authorities, it is seen as a threat to their soldiers' morale. So, it's Buch. Hoppla. Das muss ich wohl vergessen haben. Sie kennen die Dame schon länger, Herr Leutnant? Ne fais pas attention à ces imbéciles. Alors c'est ça les Allemands, une bande de porcs, oui. Sie sollten vorsichtig mit diesen Weibern sein, in jeder Hinsicht. Je me réjouis à l'idée de notre prochaine leçon. Abführen. Croyez bien, chère Madame, que nous n'allons pas vous oublier. In this war, no one has so short a life expectancy as the young junior officers. They are expected to lead their men over the top at the front line. Accordingly, they are the first to die. These young officers make up for this during their periods behind the lines, where they live life to the fullest. Behind the lines, British officers bet their pay at the races or indulge in cricket matches that last for days. At their Liebesmahl, or love feast, German officers get drunk to oblivion. Officially, as far as the authorities are concerned, this is all forbidden, but in practice, anything is possible. Even the ordinary soldiers find their distractions. Unlicensed clubs spring up where all such restrictions are ignored. All government attempts to locate such places and to close them down prove futile. Our leave from the front only lasts 48 hours. We wander from dance hall to dance hall. Who knows if we will be alive to do this again? A ravenous, egotistical collection of 20-year-old boys condemned to sexual inactivity and masturbation. I've learned to play chess. Cafes open at 5 p.m. The men from the trenches celebrate their return to life. A brief respite filled with a thousand carnal dreams, and for many, the last. In one estaminet, a lady was pouring coffee and two girls were dispensing pills to give us power in our amorous exploits. Our colonel, already a grandfather, was greedy. He took two. The girls and women were without restraint. It seemed natural, a sacrifice on the altar of patriotism. We all gratefully accepted their sacrifice. gerade gar nicht. Ich bin mit Werner verabredet. Werner Waldecker ist abgestürzt. Ein Übungsflug. Tod? Ja, tot.
heute vor einem Jahr war. It is a year ago today that we sacrificed Peter. Our young child went to war with almost sacred solemnity. He departed this world in complete communion with his convictions. His death was almost fleeting. And it is our burden to keep on living. I pictured his face. His radiant eyes, the blonde strands of hair under his tilted cap. It's all been shattered, burst apart, blood smeared, his skull in pieces. And I had him today kissed, Gretel. I had it done. Yeah, that's it, is too. Today, for the first time, I worked on his head. I cried throughout. Die Skulptur. I feel I have grown older and weaker. How can such a person take on as much as I want to? Kate. Pain and longing eat up my energy. I need strength, especially to work on Peter's effigy. Once I have done that, I would gladly die. But first, I need to finish it. Vor einem Jahr kam sein letzter Brief. It has been four days without any news from you. Though I write you every day. I would prefer it if you told me what had made you angry, rather than have this silence. My dearest Paul, your death would be mine. Jacques, tu as quelque chose pour moi? Rien aujourd'hui, Marie. I can't believe I have to wait until tomorrow to see if you have written. What an ordeal. If it was my letter in which I said I couldn't come to see you that made you angry, please try to understand. I'm too weak to undertake the journey. This alone is the reason. With millions of couples and families torn apart by war, letter writing becomes as important as never before. This is the beginning of modern mass communication. During the war in Germany alone, 28 billion postcards are written and delivered. Every single day, four million letters are delivered to the front in northern France and Belgium. This service is free. In the larger cities, the mail is delivered up to 11 times a day. For the soldiers, the post is their only connection with the normality of their former lives. For the people at home, letters from the front are their only safeguard against despair and loneliness. Dearest Paul, what a disaster to see that again there is nothing for me this morning. I am lost. I hide and I cry. I have no strength left. One day you'll regret this silence. Pray God it will not be too late. Sadness can kill too. Before the war, women were completely dependent on their husbands by law. 
access to work of their own choosing, to political activity, or even to their own money. All this was denied. Now, they have to cope on their own. They have to take on the heavy labor that their husbands used to do, and also shoulder all the responsibility for their families. On top of this comes the torment of being alone. During the war, the number of suicides and attempted suicides increases dramatically. I bought a rose. Roses are very expensive now. I used the last of my money, but it's the only thing I can do for Werner Waldecker now. I ask you, God, do you really resurrect every dead soldier so that they are not lost? Every dead Englishman, Frenchman, Russian, Zouave, Turk, and of course, German? Какой черт подери! Ну-ка встать. Тебя что, не учили, как приветствовать старшего по званию? Солдат Юрлов. Точнее, Юрлова, ваше благородие. Значит, ты и есть та самая. Слыхал, как ты воскресла из мертвых. Чего же до сих пор не дома? У меня нет дома, ваше благородие. Marina Yurlova is 15 years old and a child soldier in a Cossack unit in southern Russia. The Russian army is advancing through the Caucasus against the Turkish stronghold at Erzurum, which is considered impregnable. Despite military successes, the ability of the Russian Empire to supply its troops is on the verge of collapse. Ammunition is supplied in abundance, but the food rots en route. Hunger and disease are an even worse enemy than the army of the Ottoman Empire. By the autumn, the troops on Russia's southern front are on the verge of mutiny. The officers try to boost morale by all available means. Ваше благородие, вы позволите вернуться мне в мою часть? Нет, не позволю. Пока не позволю. Рядовой Юрлов. Юрлова. Генерал приставил тебя к награде. Георгиевскому кресту. Ваше благородие, но я же ничего... Одна из всей вашей части в живых осталась. Это уже достаточно оставание. Завтра объявим об этом перестроим. Может, газетчики будут. И вот что, Марина, может, тебе надо привести себя в порядок, помыться. Приходи ко мне завтра в апартаменты. В два. sehr unangenehme Empfindung. Ein entzündeter Mund und einige rote Flecken am Gaum. Schau. Ich sehe nichts. Hat der Herr Leutnant das denn so wild getrieben? Ich dachte, es wäre so eine Art Liebe. Liebe oder Dummheit. Es kommt aufs Gleiche raus. Ach, Pripke, kennst du nicht jemanden, zu dem ich gehen könnte? Ich will nicht zu einem Feldarzt. Ich weiß, dass die anderen Herren Offiziere immer zu einem französischen Arzt gehen, irgendwo in der Etappe. 
Sehr diskret, sehr erfahren. Wird schon nicht sein. Und Ted, you I wait idly by for the onset of a terrible illness? Is it the big S? Malheur. Malheur. That would be a pitiful way to go. The much feared Big S is, of course, syphilis. Sexually transmitted diseases are rife in the trenches. In some units, every third soldier is infected. The high incidence of sexually transmitted diseases considerably weakens the military strength of each army. Prohibition and educational films cannot solve this problem alone. Thus, alongside the business of killing, the soldier's sexuality also becomes a matter for military organization. The condom now becomes part of the standard equipment for soldiers alongside the rifle, grenade, and gas mask. The mass production and distribution of condoms is deemed vital to the war effort, as important as the production of ammunition. Condoms are distributed to all soldiers on a regular basis, and their use is mandatory under military regulations. The Sotnik had left. I was to tidy his flat and take a bath. I was confused. First he had invited me, now he seemed to ignore me. But the bath, my third since I entered the army, was delightful. Mon cher Paul, ne te désole pas ainsi. Paul, my dearest love, l'idée d'un suicide ne m'est Forgive my letters. Mais je crois quand même que le chagrin tuerait presque aussi vite. I was so unhappy that I was desperate. J'étais si malheureuse Almost que eight days without receiving any word from you. Huit jours sans rien recevoir. Je suis si heureuse. Sans francs. Tu me les rembourseras au sous près. Et tu vas prendre ça aussi. Papa. Tu sais pas de quoi ces soldats sont capables. Crois-moi, je connais les hommes mieux que toi. Oui, mais je veux un enfant. J'ai trouvé ces trucs là. Et tu vas les emporter. Si tu reviens malade, tu seras plus en état de travailler ni de me rembourser. The Sotnik's room was filthy, the floor littered with cigarette butts, dirty glasses on the windowsill, the bed unmade, the whole place stinking of stale mohorka and alcohol. But on the piano lay a lovely fat herring. I could not keep my mind off it. My head was dizzy with desire for it. Я смотрю, ты тут у меня прибираешься. Молочина. Ну, скажи, ты всегда такая душечка? М? Я думаю, да, ваше благородие. Его глаза были пустыми. His eyes had become quite vacant. And I saw that he was smiling stupidly. His look, I grew frightened. But I dared not move. 
смеялась пошевелиться. Mm -hmm. Ну что ты так стоишь? Mm -hmm. Я была так напугана, что I was so terrified мне в голову. Что случилось, прелестное дитя? Я хочу селедку ваше благородие. Ну, угощайся. The sexuality of millions of soldiers cannot be curbed by rules and regulations. By the second year of the war, military authorities have to acknowledge this fact as well. Official war brothels are established. Thousands of women are hired and directly employed by the military authorities. Accommodation is provided for them and regular medical examinations as well. The army becomes the biggest pimp in history. Everyday life in a war brothel has little to do with lustful pleasure. The soldiers are serviced a company at a time. The women are on piecework rates to ensure the satisfaction of the troops. The field medical services are to supervise the installation of field brothels for three classes, officers, junior officers, and the troops. The women employed in these services are to be clearly distinguishable and should be categorized by quality, age, and looks. Establishments with a blue light above the entrance door are reserved for officers. Those with a red light, on the other hand, are for lower ranks. The usual price is around 15 francs for 30 minutes. Care must be taken to maintain low rates of venereal disease among the girls, in that soldiers should refuse intercourse without protection. It should be pointed out that the figure of 10 visits per day per girl, which had originally been planned, may well be exceeded. The condom F14-15neo Salverson brand, Tearproof, is to be used. Due to the widespread use of this brand, it may soon be impossible to replenish supplies of this product. A visit to the brothel will cost a flat rate of four centimes. The lady gets one centime, likewise for the house, two are for the Red Cross. Every morning, the women are examined by an army doctor. Le lendemain de ta visite, ce cas pour aller. Je viens me trouver pour me convoquer à l'examen médical de la Croix-Rouge. Les autorités voulaient savoir si toi, officiellement, t'avais pu fréquenter une femme malade. Malade Tu veux dire... J'ai refusé. Tu es revenu trois fois. Trois fois, j'ai dit non. Demain, je dois me rendre à l'examen et me mettre en prison. Nata, ça c'est une chose. Chaise. Chaise. Tu sais bien, mon petit amour. C'est bien que je te suis fidèle. Je voulais apprendre. Son, les tétons. Il est tard, Jeanne. Je ne voudrais pas qu'il me surprenne encore ici. Je te donne 10 millions de baisers. Cœur plein de larmes. Une cause que nous pour heute. I went and stared at myself in his mirror, as if to see the reason for his behavior. He did not see what I saw. I was not a girl. I was a soldier.
Moi, je te dégoûte. C'était si long, Paul. Si long. Je m'en sens toute ratatinée. C'est comme si t'attendais si longtemps, ça m'avait... Ça m'avait desséché. Ma chérie. T'as pas besoin d'avoir peur. Tu sens si bon. T'es si bonne. Si douce. Un amour comme le nôtre peut jamais s'éteindre. Tu seras toujours pour moi la jeune fille qui a su faire vibrer mon cœur. Christmas 1915 is coming, but peace is nowhere to be seen. The military authorities have written 1915 off as a lost year. None of the major offensives in Galicia or the Caucasus, on the beaches of Gallipoli or in the hills of Artois, have been decisive. The generals are already planning new campaigns for the next year, with more guns, more men, and more destructive power than ever before at their disposal. Once the snow melts, they will commence. The soldiers in the trenches know nothing of this. They still dream of returning home and of peace. I could go on forever, and yet I never get closer to him, to my Peter. I keep searching for him, as though I were to find him in my work. And yet everything I manage to do is so childishly weak and insufficient. I cannot go on. I don't have enough strength. I'm too wrecked, cried out, weakened. A genius could do it, and a man. I cannot. I cannot. Encore Oui, encore. Tu peux déjà commencer à nous construire un berceau, grand-papa Franzosen töten gehen. Was, Kripke? Besser dir als wir. Besser dir als wir. Besser dir als wir! Ange!
aims were high. Humans had dreamed of taking wing for centuries. We were the first who were not content with dreams alone. We flew high into the sky aboard our airships. The world was at our feet. Every day brought new inventions which promised to make life easier for us. Electrical lighting banished darkness from our cities. The night was no longer just for sleeping. We built automobiles in gargantuan factories outside our cities. Soon, every one of us would own one of these miracle machines. To have more of everything seemed to be the key to fulfillment for us. Until the summer of 1914. No more laughter or singing. My companions were more often drunk than not, for the Red Cross units had brought in large stores of vodka, and the authorities began to serve out generous rations in the hopes that the drink would keep our minds off the work that lay ahead. <clears throat> Not a few of them begged me to write letters home in my spare moments. These letters made a strange impression on me. Here I was, writing to other men's wives, about the children, the crops, a cow sore udder, a pregnant ewe, and almost invariably ending with, If God pleased to kill me, pray for my soul. Oh, what was five again? I think there is only one thing I dislike more than learning a new language. And that is nursing a cold in my head. What do you think? Am I a complete idiot? Oh, don't worry. I can't memorize any of these Russian words either. I didn't mean the Russian. This journey. All of this. Is it not all idiotic? Well, it's a little late to worry about that now. <laughs> yes, it is too late. Far too late. Sarah McNaughton was born in Scotland in 1864 and had an upper-class upbringing. Like many women of her class, she sees it as her patriotic duty to support Great Britain and her wartime allies in any way possible. As volunteer nurses, they seek to relieve privation and suffering wherever their aid is most needed. The situation is particularly drastic in Russia, which is under immense pressure from fighting on two long fronts and accordingly lacks adequate medical support. The civilian population suffers even more than the army, especially in remote areas that are difficult to reach. Why are the Armenians so hated? And why are we all so oblivious to their fate? After all, they're Christians just like us, human beings like us. So much about this war is simply incomprehensible. You can't really ask me that, Sarah. The only thing I learned before the war was, whenever possible, never to ask awkward questions. And ideally, never to show any sensibility towards all that is horrible. And yet now there is nothing but horror in the world. We're already doing what we can. We're going to help. Yes, help. I just wonder whom we're helping, exactly. The Armenians? or our own conscience. Sarah McNaughton's journey takes her from Petrograd to Moscow and all the way on to the uttermost southern reaches of the Russian Empire. 
Here, Russian troops are winning significant victories over the Ottoman army. At the beginning of 1916, they take the key border fortress at Erzurum and push deeper and deeper into Turkish territory. The majority of the population on both sides of the border in this combat zone are Christian Armenians. They now come into direct contact with the war. The Muslim generals of the Ottoman Empire need someone to blame for a series of defeats. And so they make scapegoats of their Christian subjects. Countless Armenians flee into Russia. The refugees describe brutal massacres ordered by the Turkish authorities against the Armenian people. Despite this, the refugees are not welcome in Russia. We must have come to the wrong place. <laughs> well, it was fearfully cold. <laughs> As a result, the McNaughton cough has been heard in the land. <laughs> Refugees here, and no war. <coughs> you really must take better care of yourself, Sarah. <laughs> there is no need for us here. We're leaving. Please be welcome, Mrs. Miss McNaughton, and my dear friend, Lady Dorothy. It's a pleasure for me, my ladies. Um, Duchess Ignatievna, the head nurse of the St. Alexios Hospital here in Tiflis. Duchess Ignatievna, we are certainly very pleased to find everything here in such a spotless condition. But where are the wounded? The refugees? But we are very far from the front here. And what use have our funds then been in this evidently functionless hospital? Mrs. Uh, McNaughton, how is that to say? Uh, we will cross that bridge when we reach it. Давай быстрее, ну быстрее, она уже давно должен быть здесь. Поторопись. Perhaps uh, you would like uh, tea? <coughs> Значит так, мужики, слушай сюда внимательно. Это противогазы. На всех у нас не хватит, но Но это, это ничего. От этого чертового немецкого газа маленько дерет в горле. Ну, у вас получится. Значит так, каждый, кто получил противогаз, найдите его, тренируйтесь, давайте, давайте. Давай, давай, давай. Давай, пробуй, пробуй, пробуй. Держи, Марина. Повтори за мной, иначе капут. Давай. Ну, сержант, почему нельзя выдать противогаз каждому? Приказ командования. На вас нет ни жилья, ни боеприпасов, ни койки в госпиталь. Отправить назад не могут. Пойдете первая волна, понятно? Давай, давай, мир. Так, ну что тут? Первая волна. The first meet. When the great offensive actually began, there wouldn't be any trumpets or flags or glory. Just a crowd of useless half lunatics sent ahead onto the enemy's guns. The Russian Cossack Marina Yurlova is just 16 years old, and she's already been awarded the Cross of St. George, the highest military honor that the Tsar can bestow on a soldier. She took part in the Russian offensive against the Ottoman Empire in Anatolia. The German Empire, which was allied with the Turks, sends some of its best generals to this remote region. The Germans also equipped the Turkish army with the most modern weapons available. All means possible must be used to prevent their front from collapsing.
Poison gas has been feared by soldiers ever since its first use by the Germans in early 1915. Since then, researchers on both sides have been trying to develop newer and even more treacherous compounds. Each army goes to huge expense to equip its soldiers with gas masks in order to protect them. It's an arms race. As gas masks become increasingly efficient, new ways of breaching them are developed. It's a vicious cycle of horror. Battle was joined before daybreak. It was half hidden behind the clouds, made by the exploding gas shells. It seemed surreal, but that did not make it any less bloody. Dawn amplified the ugly twilight that hung between the gas clouds. And we moved through it like ghosts. My mask seemed to be a divide between me and the world out there. I watched the battle around me through this divide. Nobody looked human anymore. Even if someone fell, he fell like an animal and lay there, masked face pointing upwards. The body contorted and twisted on its side. So far, we have been waiting all this time for wounded soldiers, for refugees, and for our cars. They left long before we did, but they have not arrived yet. If we carry on at that pace, you'll scrub right through the floorboards. You really ought to rest. <laughs> But it's precisely this unending rest which I find madly. <coughs> <coughs> We're all depressed, I'm afraid. Whatever the Russians may have in store for us in the way of useful work, nothing can exceed our current boredom. And I've still got this horrid bad cough. this duchess knitting anyway. Those socks will never find their way to the front. We're leaving by train for Erevan. Yerevan? What by God's name do you expect to do there? But you yourself informed us that most of the Armenian refugees were there. Yes, but I'm sorry. The trains are overflowing. We will not find space for the medical equipment. If we do, it will be stolen. But one million Armenian refugees have been slaughtered in cold blood by the Turks around about here. There are the most awful massacres with cruelties past all telling. Patience, my dear English friends. Need to have more patience. <clears throat> For months, I've been trying to be of some sort of help. The best thing, I believe, will be to return to my old battalion. I've been wondering whether, if they go in and get cut up badly, there might be any chance of success if I apply for a transfer to join them. There might come a time during which they might not disdain an old sergeant of their own. I want the entire regiment mobilized by tomorrow evening. Yes, sir. <sighs> Look at the old man they sent us now. What on earth use can he be out here? Simply because I'm 50, I have to live with the shirkers here, not with the friends I love and honour. Ah, my dear friend. Charles Edward Montague, is that right? Renowned journalist. Yes, sir, quite right. Who's desperately been hoping to serve at the front for months now. I will have a really rather splendid assignment for you, Montague. Addies, follow me. Born in 1867, Charles Edward Montague is actually too old for active service on the front line. Nevertheless, the journalist goes to great lengths in order to be permitted to serve in the army. Within the British Army, the Propaganda and Press Censorship Department has a key role to play. They respond to the findings of military intelligence and work to ensure that major offensives enjoy the support of the public at home. 
for the Parliament in London has to be convinced time and again to send new weapons and ever more soldiers to the front in Belgium and France. Here he is, a true war hero, our Montague, wounded on several occasions, always in the midst of the action. At your age, and still a sergeant, Mr. Montague. Ah, he may seem like an ordinary sergeant, but I can assure you he is a man of real intelligence. And with this new assignment, he will be promoted accordingly. Sir, if I may, what exactly is my new assignment? Given the forthcoming offensive... Now, now, Montague, it's a good thing we're amongst friends. The offensive is a state secret, you know. Everybody's talking about it. The final push to decide the war, sir. Precisely. And your assignment will be to lead Mr. Collingridge here straight to the front to see our men. A tour, so to speak, of the reality of the war. You see, back at home, we so rarely get a true picture of your experiences out here. Mm, you're not the truest of realities, Montague. I believe we understand each other. And in the end, I shall hold you personally responsible for the safety of our honorable member of parliament. I'm certain you'll find quite the thrilling spot for us. To my unspeakable horror, in his enthusiasm, he had suddenly grasped my hand. Uh, Cross here will discuss the rest of the details with you, Montague. As you wish, sir. After two years of war, the valiant survivors are showered with fame and decorations as never before. But the generals are just as far as ever from reaching a decisive outcome. The euphoria at the war's outbreak has long since vanished amongst the soldiers. They were feted as war heroes, but increasingly, they see themselves as victims of the war. Propaganda has to be employed at the front, just like at home, to reassure everyone that all that's needed is one last push in order to overcome the enemy. Noch ist das Ziel nicht erreicht. Noch ist der Wahn der Feinde nicht gebrochen. Unsere glorreichen Siege und die ehrende Willenskraft, mit der unser kämpfendes Volk vor dem Feinde und daheim. Our own troops have never been more sure of final victory. hat bürgen dafür, dass unser geliebtes Vaterland auch fernhin nichts zu fürchten hat. La victoire ou la mort. Jamais cette expression n'a été aussi appropriée. Wir haben den unbeugsamen Entschluss, den Kampf durchzukämpfen, bis der Frieden. Flammen der Entrüstung und heiliger Zaun werden jedes deutschen Mannes und Weibes Kraft verdoppeln. Avanti dunque, o soldati d'Italia. Schiesst, il Zell ist williger als sie. Es gilt die letzten Schläge, den Sieg zu den vollenden. Den Sieg zu vollenden. Just arrived here in the slums of Woolwich, in the outskirts of London. The roads here are vile, cut to bits and thick with mud. Mary, get over here. You lost your way. Excuse me, could you please point me in the right direction? I'm looking for hall number two of the munitions factory. This girl be a very good Such a fine lady. What's your business here? A volunteer, I suppose. It's over there. Hope you've seen that one here again. Won't make a bet. Show me your papers. Gabrielle West comes from southwest England. As befits her family's social standing, they live in a country house with a horse and carriage. She is just one of the many patriotic women seeking work during the war, not as a source of income, but as a way of serving her country. The arms industry is in dire need of workers. To satisfy its need for ever more soldiers, Great Britain introduced military conscription at the beginning of 1916 in order to swell the ranks of the army. Nearly four million Britons are now in the armed forces, and the munitions factories are desperate for manpower. I have a good deal of experience, having worked with the Red Cross. Would you like to see my references? 
And are you familiar with this kind of environment? <laughs> what on earth is that? Sulfuric and nitric acid together, they're important in producing dynamite, and the explosives our men out there in France need a couple of hundred tons of the stuff a day. <laughs> I can see three of these approaches. particles of acid land on your face and make you merely mad. Like pins and needles. Only much more so. They get up your nose and down your throat and into your eyes, so that you are blind and speechless by the time you make your escape. Did the Red Cross teach you how to handle the um the effect of this stuff uh, in case of an emergency? Well, the procedure is relatively simple. If conscious, give an emetic. If blue in the face, apply artificial respiration. If very blue, oxygen. But perhaps that's uh, obvious to you. I'm afraid the Red Cross simply had me running up <coughs> a large kitchen. Really? In our kitchen, we have two nieces of the Duchess of Wellington. And sadly, they couldn't tell the difference between a turnip and a boiled egg. There's some room here by me, if you like. Like other countries in this war, Great Britain depends on its women being prepared to make sacrifices to keep the arms industry going. The working conditions are almost unbearable. Poisonous substances used in this industry cause severe health problems and can even be deadly for the workers. And yet, month after month, some of the biggest factories in history enter production. The army needs more grenades bombs and cartridges than ever before. Military strategists become convinced that this war will be decided on an entirely new battlefield, that of industry. They think that the offensives thus far have failed because insufficient destructive power was amassed to support them. This, they claim, will now change. Germany is planning to test the extent of its munitions making capability at Verdun. It's not considered essential to achieve a breakthrough there. The aim, instead, is to bleed the French troops to death with constant bombardment. The countries of the Triple Entente, on the other hand, have agreed to a coordinated offensive on all fronts. In the east, Russia is to advance along a broad front against Austria-Hungary. And Italy will launch an offensive at her border on the river Isonzo. The British and French are to commence a decisive offensive in France at the River Somme. Listen, Montague, I have a feeling this is somehow staged. I think you may be right, sir. Show me what life is really like out here. The front. After all, that's what I was promised. I'm glad to hear you're so concerned with the fate of the ordinary soldier, sir. But it won't hurt to have a cup of tea first, wouldn't you say? I feel a kind of grudge against the mere sightseer who comes out to see the war as a sort of show, accompanied by all sorts of luxury and petting. None for me, thank you. Tell me, does the barbed wire not get in the way during an attack? I think someone should inform the war office. I think we all feel in our hearts that the sightseer's only chance of saving his soul alive is that he should get a taste, if only for a few minutes, of the kind of thing that our soldiers are bearing all day. When you're ready, sir. War hath no fury like a non-combatant. <laughs> the hospital here in Russia, I believe, cost England 100,000 pounds. The staff consists of nurses and doctors, dresses, etc., all fully paid. The expenses of those in charge of it are met out of the funds. They live in good hotels and even have entertaining allowances for entertaining their friends. Miss McNaughton, celebrate a little with us. Life must go. I don't have anything to celebrate here. Maybe you do. Concerning your ambulance car. The cars have arrived. 
Dorothy, our cars. I have good news and bad news. The first vehicle has reached Petrograd. That's wonderful news. However, my dear friend, the Grand Duchess Irina, requires it at this time. Everything's promised. Nothing is done. The only hope of getting a move on is by bribery. And one may bribe the wrong people till one finds one's way about. Perhaps Her Highness could coordinate with us. If she prefers to sponsor another hospital, after all, we have paid for it all. Her Highness doesn't currently possess any other means of attending the opera. The season has just begun. I despair of this country. If the Russians were not our allies, I should feel inclined to say that nothing would do them so much good as a year or two of German conquest. I was on my way through the no man's land. I had to stop. Where was the English line and where was the German? I'd gotten lost and had no idea what to do. Suddenly, I heard whispers and I steadied myself for combat. Are they English? Are they German? If they're English, I could get the Iron Cross for a daring assault. If they're Germans, I could be shot down by my own men if I dare to approach. 21-year-old Ernst Jünger has gone from being an ordinary volunteer soldier to an experienced and highly decorated lieutenant. He prefers to fight man to man, and so the German army's new tactics suit him well. Small units of shock troops are used to ambush and occupy enemy trenches to form pockets of resistance. These pinprick attacks cannot mask the underlying problem. The longer the war goes on, the clearer it becomes that Germany's enemies are ahead of her and her allies in terms of their material resources and troops. Das war verdammt knapp, Herr Leutnant. Beinahe hätten wir sie abgeknallt. Na, ich freue mich auch, euch zu sehen. Wie viele seid ihr? Der ganze Zug, Herr Leutnant. Sie hatten My men were sure that I was wounded and decided to go look for me despite enemy fire. When they first saw me crawling, they thought I was an Englishman. Der Junge hat nichts als Rosinen im Kopf. Na, wo wir alle wieder vereint sind, wollen wir mal schön wieder nach Hause gehen. Was, Jungs? Anywhere, Montague? Oh, we don't need a periscope. Follow me. Is this in any way safe? Well, let's find out. Come along, sir. June 24th, 1916 sees the beginning of a bombardment bigger than anything the world has ever seen before. The Battle of the Somme is underway. Around 1,500 artillery guns fire incessantly day and night for an entire week. A deadly hail of over 1.5 million shells rain down on the German lines. The aim is to raise the German positions to the ground and annihilate every person in them. Miles and miles of our front begin to dance with smoke twinkling and shimmering flashes. We cannot conceive the completeness of destruction. And yet, shellfire gives me a mental stimulus that nothing else does. Are you trying to get us killed? Sometimes I think it would be a fine thing to be killed in this war. You're mad, Montague! Come back down here now! Alas, I do believe I could make quite a decent subsistence after the war by taking millionaire Americans round the battlefield. 
field for the rest of my life. pieces of sugar for me. Only one each, I'm afraid. We're wasting away. And you won't even give us enough sugar for our tea. The sugar is rationed, I assure you. It isn't my decision. I'm feeling dizzy. Please don't make a scene of a piece of sugar. Mary! Stop here! Falling! Catch her! Let me pass you! The ether in the cordite affects the girls. It gives some headaches, hysteria, and sometimes fits. If a worker has the least tendency to epilepsy, even if she has never shown it before, the ether will bring it out. Some of the girls have 12 fits or more, one after the other. The diamond! The diamond! Okay! Give me my here! Ich würde zu gerne wissen, wo wir eigentlich sind. Wir müssen hier raus. Die schießt sich ein. Da müssen wir lang. Andersrum wird zu raus. Von da sind wir gekommen. Hier muss doch irgendein Dorf sein. Warte, komm. Aber Leute, wir haben sie hier Dorf. This battle of munitions drags on for months, by day and by night. Newer and deadlier weapons keep emerging. Flame-throwing monsters are used to break the defense lines, and the first military tanks in history are used during the Battle of the Somme. In the hell that is the modern battlefield, it's not the brave who survive, it's the lucky. Seldom do individual soldiers fight against each other. This is a war against overwhelming machines that make the individual soldier appear smaller and smaller until he disappears. The fire had grown to one of terrific strength. The ground was shaking. The sky was like a witch's cauldron. There were hundreds of heavy batteries. Countless shells crisscrossed above us. My ears were about to burst. I'm not afraid to die, but if I have to die, then let it be in a fight. Man against man, not like an insect accidentally stepped on by a boot. When will the next shell come and bury me? Bury me alive? It was a stomach-wrenching wait. Und bangen. Dear Lord, please, save me. If only I could daydream and not think about death. But wretched thoughts keep turning around inside my head. I can no longer think. I am no longer alive. I can no longer write. I can no longer read. I no longer believe in anything. I dread being asleep more than awake, as my dreams are so frightful. I lay and trembled. All fear of shells and explosions had left me. I watched them as calmly as one would watch an apple fall off a tree, with tears pouring down my face. I felt no pain, except a dull ache in my right arm. Turning my head, which ached hideously at first motion, I could see the chevron on my left shoulder. 
Jules learned the rest of me was buried in the earth. <laughs> How long had I lain there unconscious? Two or three hours, perhaps? It was very quiet. Only the distant roar of guns told me that the advance had swept on. And I was completely alone. What exactly were you thinking during this mission, Montague? I could have you caught, Marshal! Surely one goes to the theatre to see the play, not to enjoy the intervals between the acts. But they're within reach of enemy guns! Last week, I read in a respectable London newspaper... I could have been killed! ...that the British people as a whole would give their lives to secure a victory. Pull yourself together. The man has connections at the War Office. He could cause some serious trouble. Mr. Collingridge, sir, you are living proof of it. I'm honoured to have met you. Bravo. Come on, kids. Come on, kids. Is Tim not there? A dismal answer came to me across the darkness. It was the howling of wolves. Hunting along the edges of the night. They seemed to be coming nearer, and I could do nothing but scrabble at the earth in the hope of covering up my face so they would not find me. Gradually, the fear disappeared and gave way to a drowsiness that was the beginning of death. My eyes told me without surprise that some stars had clambered down from the sky and were bobbing up and down at the edge of my hole. The stars had voices. And so, my journey continued alone. I have heard that in Yerevan, a city of 30,000 inhabitants, there are as many as 17,000 Armenian refugees. Since the war broke out, I think I have seen the actual breaking of a wave of anguish which has swept over the world. I often wonder if I can feel much more. But these human beings I now see for myself, <coughs> pitiful remnants of a massacre. Only old women and children, mind you. All the men are killed. The reports of the Armenian refugees sound unbelievable. But the systematic displacement and annihilation of the Armenians that they describe is a fact. With the support of large sections of the Turkish population, the Ottoman army and police are perpetrating genocide against hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children. We saw that all those who laid at the edge of the caravan were driven out, especially the young girls. They were beheaded or had their stomachs slashed. Those who remained alive were left on the ground naked to die. Every girl was nailed to a cross alive. The nails were driven through their hands and feet. And only their brown hair blowing in the wind covered their bodies. Other men had their hands tied behind their backs and were rolled down steep cliffs. Women were waiting below with knives. They stabbed those who'd been rolled down until they were dead. We were taken to a cliff. People hoisted up the women like sacks, set the hems of their skirts on fire and threw them down the cliff. There were screams everywhere. When it was my turn, I jumped off quickly. Bleeding and trembling, I crept away to a corner and lost consciousness. 
The hillside was covered with half-naked and still bleeding bodies. Fathers, brothers, sons and grandsons lay as they fell from the bullets. Flocks of vultures were picking the eyes out of the dead and dying. Why is nobody helping? Why is nobody doing anything? I've been assigned the night shift, which means 24 hours without a bed and without sleeping. What rotten luck. I thought I could manage, do my bit, but I just don't have what it takes for this kind of work. The country might, in fact, do rather better without the likes of me. My dear Miss Wren. We're under attack! Now, now, calm down, calm down, ladies. Now, how are you going to show it up? Go on, calmly. That's it. Hurry, please. Keep calm! Before the war broke out, Zeppelins were admired as wonders of technology. Their long range allowed them to cross the English Channel and fly bombing raids over England and even Scotland. Although the bombing campaigns cannot yet achieve blanket destruction, they have a powerful psychological impact. Air raids are soon targeting not just the enemy soldiers and arms factories, they now threaten cities far from the front, killing civilians, women, and children. Great Britain had lost the advantage of being an island. Mary Morgan. Mary! The Zeppelin was high up, like a small sausage in the sky. Three searchlights were playing on it. The situation is catastrophic. Three bombs have hit the train station, and three fell behind the church. The largest one tore a crater two meters deep. The Edinburgh people got a big fright. As we in Scotland have been feeling lately that they were sure to let us off scot-free. But we were wrong. Four houses were completely demolished and all the inmates buried. When I saw it early in the morning, they had recovered 14 bodies. But later in the day, they brought a baby boy of about three years out, alive and conscious. A Zeppelin has destroyed nine houses last night. Parisians are now calling for vengeance against a German city. Vengeance that does not spare the civilian population. Chain bombs hit a three-story house, causing it to collapse like a house of cards. Those who were buried under the rubble in the cellar had still not been recovered by evening. Two 
issue this for you, was it? This area used to have meadows, and forests, and fields of wheat. Now nothing remained. Nothing at all. Not a blade of grass anywhere, not one single strand. Every square millimeter of ground had been plowed and plowed again. The trees uprooted, destroyed, and ground to mulch. The houses blown away, rocks ground to powder, mountains blown apart. In short, everything was now desert. Hello, Dan. Hello, Dan. Hello, Dan. That's my Vogel. Vom ganzen Zug sind nur noch wir beide übrig. Nur wir beide. On the morning of July 1st, 1916, the bombardment on the Somme suddenly ceases. 20 British and 11 French divisions move forward to take the German trenches. The generals promised their soldiers a walk in the park. Hardly any of the enemy will have survived the barrage. But the German defensive troops had dug themselves deep into their positions. Concealed gun emplacements are swiftly made ready, and the British advance under terrific fire. The result is catastrophic. On this summer's day, 19,000 British soldiers die. It's the bloodiest day in British military history. Not a single breakthrough in the German lines is achieved. The list of our losses have come in. to explain this defeat to the readers back at home. Well, you are a journalist, Montague. There cannot and simply will not be a defeat. Understood? A journalist informs the public, sir. He does not lie to his readers. Well, then it's time you became a war correspondent. The truth. Should we all just give up and go home, try to be reasonable, Montague? Moreover, General Headquarters is still firmly convinced the victory is imminent. Great Britain conveys its gratitude to the families of the fallen. The soldiers who died in the Battle of the Somme are referred to as heroes, and some receive posthumous decorations. The propaganda machine glorifies the bloody event as a major victory. But at the same time, war press censorship prohibits newspapers from publishing lists of the dead. Of my old battalion, only two officers and some 80 men are left. Not to be with them feels somewhat like a betrayal on my part. To be alive while they perish. If we, outside the trenches, bore what men in the trenches do, the war would be over at once.
My own losses are almost stupefying. And something dead within myself looks with sightless eyes on death. With groping hands, I touch it sometimes. And then I know I am dead also. I should like to have left the party, quitted the feast of life, when all was gay and amusing. I would have been sorry to come away, but it would have been far better than being left till all the lights are out. Crops were bountiful. Our cellars and barns well stocked. Hunger was the stuff of fairy tales. Decades of peace had made us prosperous and rich. Our ancestors had dreamt of a land of plenty. For us, that dream seemed now to be a reality. We ate and drank not just to satisfy our needs, no, we had discovered the pleasures of indulgence. No one in Europe need ever starve again. Of that, we were certain. Until the summer of 1914. Mm-hmm. 
verwundet und gefangen. Wir sind in Moskau. Sind? Ihr habt vielleicht gehört, dass ich tot bin. Tot? Tot bin. Was noch? Aber ich lebe. Ich? Ich lebe. Und ich habe keinen anderen Wunsch, als endlich die Heimat wiederzusehen. The longing for home was getting to all of us. I asked the nurse to write home to my loved ones, since she spoke and wrote a few words of German. My heart? Heimat. Heimat, man schreibt es H-E-I-M-A-T. Heimat. Wiedersehen. In der Schule ist eine Sache. Connections have been organized at school. Over. Copper, tin, lead, zinc, brass and cast iron are all needed. They are to be turned into rifle barrels, cannons, cartridge casings and anything else. Our classrooms are competing for which one can collect the most. My class has collected a lot. I turned everything upside down at home. Grandmother was not pleased. Sometimes I think that the old don't understand that we all have to do our part in the war. Maybe it's because when they were young, wars didn't last this long. A continuous supply of raw materials, metals in particular, is now a decisive factor in modern warfare. Initially, the military rely on public generosity. Now, that's not enough to satisfy the army's growing needs. Soon, the disposal of scrap metal is subject to license. And anyone who holds much needed material back is punished. Items that had been admired or had been painstakingly erected at home during the preceding decades were now melted down to supply sufficient shells and guns for the months-long offensives. The church bells, which rang in 1914 at the beginning of the war, have now been silenced forever. School children went out into the fields with their teachers to gather herbs. These were needed for the wounded. We also needed gloves, socks, shawls, and hats from Grey Wolf. Now we are to give gold for the fatherland as well. I have several things made of gold, most of which I got for my confirmation, and I love them very much. So now I too will sacrifice for the fatherland. Coins rained down into my little basket, which was decorated with flowers. The smiles of the people walking by told me what a good patriot I had truly become. We were all told to bring woolen things to school. Then we were later told that we were to bring in anything made of lead, brass and copper as well. We visited the junk shop to collect empty jars which we wheeled about in an empty pram. Not very glamorous, but we felt we were helping to win the war. Wie sollen wir über den Winter kommen, wenn du alles wegschleppst? Die Säuglinge im Krankenhaus brauchen es dringender als wir. Elfriede Kur was born in 1902. She lives with her grandmother in Schnadermühl in the province of Posen in eastern Germany. Elfriede is not a good student. Instead, she pours all her energy into helping the war effort, as all children are encouraged to do. For many of Germany's students, the war has become more important than school. They want to do their part to ensure their fatherland's final victory. 
More and more classes are canceled. Most teachers serve at the front. The students are tasked with bringing in the harvest and collecting resources or donations. They are willing to sacrifice and are easily indoctrinated. The propaganda machinery styles them into soldiers on the home front. denn hier mit Kartoffeln? Milch brauchen wir und Stoff für die Windeln. Wir müssen uns schon mit Zeitungspapier behelfen. Das Leinen habe ich schon an die Soldaten weggegeben und, und Milch habe ich schon seit einem Jahr nicht mehr gesehen. Wenn du wirklich helfen willst, ja. dann geh aus dem Weg. Wir haben keinen Platz mehr frei. Aber der Kleine schreit ja gar nicht. Der Kleine hat keine Kraft dazu. Ich habe keine Milch für ihn. Dann müssen wir ihn doch hier behalten. Wir. Bitte. Bitte. Kommen Sie. Danke. His name was Gear Harkin, and I had immediately grown fond of him. Why, why? Was ist los? Поднимайтесь. Was passiert? Вставай! Вставай! Поднимайся! Все! Вставай быстро! Вставай! Я не шоссен! Пошел отсюда! Вон! Внимайтесь тоже! Быстро! Карл Кассер was born in 1889 on a farm in Kielb in Lower Austria. He was seriously wounded on the Eastern Front and taken prisoner. Farmers like him make up the majority of the army. Back home, because the fields are neglected, the harvest yields get worse from year to year. Millions of these peasant soldiers die in the battles along the eastern front of the Habsburg Empire. A further two million men surrender to the enemy, more prisoners than in any other theater of this war. Austrians, Czechs, Poles, and Hungarians all fall into Russian hands as prisoners of war. The Tsar's regime is unprepared for such numbers and ill-equipped to care for them. Transportation was organized for the men. We thought this must surely mean that peace was soon to come. Natasha! Natasha! The brief, the Zettel. The overbring is personally, this goes quickly. Thus, so we were taken away. And all those we were leaving behind, and all those we were leaving behind wished us luck on our journey back home, for we all believed that we were going to be exchanged for our enemy's prisoners. Not only in Russia are prisoners of war being transported back and forth on trains, but all over the world. In Europe, as well as Japan, Africa, and the Middle East. During the war, one in 10 soldiers was taken prisoner, uncertain as to what his fate would be. In total, there were nearly eight million prisoners of war. No country can cope with the sheer numbers. Neither food nor clothing nor accommodation is available in sufficient quantity. The plight of the prisoners becomes ever more desperate the longer the war lasts. My wounds had pretty much healed. Only the bones in my hand remained a little unstable. I was glad I'd healed so well. Since so weit genesen war. Ja, 
Schlimm. In der Heimat, in der Heimat, da gibt's ein Wiedersehen, ein Wiedersehen. In der Heimat, in der Heimat, da gibt's ein Wiedersehen. Quando fumo catturati. When we were taken prisoner, a soldier next to me sobbed, what will my mother say? We'd stop thinking about the future. For now, our lives swung like a pendulum between boredom and pain as we tried to hold on to fading memories. At home, they're celebrating the Cherry Blossom Festival. All I see here are dead trees and barbed wire. Home. I tried not to think of it. Things were bad enough as they were, but to think of home and all it meant made one feel absolutely hopeless. I am relieved to have news from home. Packages have arrived from our friends, thank God. They say that English hearts are beating somewhere behind these snow-capped mountains. The first postcard from home. Papa is glad that I'm out of danger. If only he knew what new dangers I face here. Hundreds of prisoners die daily in the dirt. There are no doctors, no medicine, no beds, no food. The gas is being cut off. There are no candles to be had. No petroleum, no spirit. So how one is to cook, let alone have a lighted room, I don't know. The renowned German sense of organization seems to fail terribly when it comes to social rather than military matters. Hello? Können Sie nicht lesen? Kohlen sind aus. A new order about coals has appeared. No one is allowed to have more than a quarter of a ton. Well, there are none to be had anyway, so the order does not do much harm. Hallo? Ich kann bezahlen. Geht ihr denn überhaupt noch? Aus England. Kommen Sie mal mit nach hinten, schnell. Piano teacher Ethel Cooper has been living in her adopted home of Leipzig for several years. Some 15,000 kilometers away from her Australian family in Adelaide. As part of the British Empire, Australia, as well as New Zealand and Canada, side with Great Britain during the war. Any citizens of these countries who happen to live in Germany now find themselves on the wrong side of the front line. Overnight, they have become the enemy and are not allowed to leave the country. Some are arrested and interned in a detention center. Those who remain free join together with their German neighbors in a daily struggle to get food and fuel. Fräulein Lüdiger, hätten Sie nicht einen Korb oder eine Tasche, damit ich die Kohlen nach oben bekomme? Helfen Sie mir hochtragen. Oben in der Wohnung findet sie sicher etwas für Sie. Danke. Schinken. Schinken habe ich seit zwei Jahren nicht mehr im Laden gesehen. Brauchen Sie welchen? Ich mache einen guten Preis. She came laden up to the eyes with eatables. I couldn't believe my senses. And then discovered, to my mixed horror and amusement, that she's making a small private business out of buying food in Poland, getting it smuggled in, and then selling it in Germany at a very considerable profit. Übrigens, was den Schinken betrifft, was ist denn mit Ihrer wunderbaren englischen Wanduhr? Brauchen Sie die noch? Any other people on earth would rise against a government that had reduced it to such misery. But these folks seem to have no spirit left. Oh, 
Was gab er dir jetzt für eine Brezel? Frisch und duftend. Vom Falkenstein in Kiel. Ja, frisch aus dem Ofen. Bevor wir aufs Feld gegangen sind, hat man die Liesel immer auch nicht aufs Fenster gegeben. Das waren die Besten. Woher willst du das wissen? Du bist ja sicher nie in Kiel gewesen. Ich bin da geboren. Was? Jesus, Maria, da müssen wir uns ja kennen. Ich wusste aber nicht, wer es sein soll. I didn't know who he was. We had beards, long hair. As we had nothing with which to shave or cut our hair. We were almost unrecognizable. Fast unkenntlich. Na, das gibt's ja nicht. Du bist der Kasser, Karl. Das Hepp. Ja. Das Hepp aus Kiel. Ja. Ich mache mir Platz. Ich nehme mich Zeit. Komm, setz dich her da. Das gibt's nicht. We beschlossen, we agreed that we would no longer be separated. We told each other about our loved ones back home, whereupon we both had tears in our eyes, since neither of us knew how things were for them back there. It was from zu Hause. Feeling is running very high against England. I loathe most of all this policy of hate breeding, which is being followed everywhere. The stories of English brutality, barbarism, and deceit that flood the whole press would only be laughable if one didn't boil to think that everyone here must more or less believe such lies, because nothing else appears. How frightfully bitter the feeling of the whole nation is against us. <coughs> <coughs> bad one to telephone in English or to speak English in the streets. At the concert hall, all music and all musicians that are not German and Austrian are now tabooed. Only at home am I able to play. Hatred of the British has been intensified by their naval blockade. The British try to starve their enemy's population into submission. In the English Channel and in the north of Scotland, the Royal Navy blocks the sea lanes from the Atlantic to the North Sea. No vessel is allowed into German ports. All German-bound goods are seized. Military supplies and civilian foodstuff alike. The consequences are devastating. Trade in the German Empire plummets by over 50%. Warehouses lay empty. Merchants wait in vain for their next delivery. The situation in Austria-Hungary is even worse. Soon, there will be nowhere left where people can buy meat, flour, butter, or milk. The little food that is available is rationed and distributed only upon the presentation of a specially issued card. Each day, new hardships further embitter the populace and fuel their hatred of the enemy. We will hate you with fiery hatred. Our hatred will never fade. The suffocating hatred of 70 million knows but one enemy, England. Down with the Germans, down with them all. Our oh, army and navy, be sure of their fall. Spare not one the deceitful spies. Cut out their tongues, pull out their eyes. Revenge I serve to the dishonorable, nefarious Russians. Honey I will be in their mouths to poison. I do not fear the enemy. God is our friend. God is our helper. Shoot the Russians, beat up the French, and give the greatest villain, the Brit, a kick. We have no home. Enemies took everything, even our little bed. Punish them, avenge the children of France, Belgian children, Serb children, and the Polish ones too. Pomme de terre à la cave. Wait, wait. 
Et n'oublie pas le vin, hein The Germans are searching all the houses. Our city is in the hands of thieves. Mais qu'est-ce que tu fais avec Coco Je le cache. Coco ne va pas se tenir tranquille. Pauvre Coco. Poor Coco. You were a true patriot. Yves Congar was born in 1904 and lives with his family in Sedan in northeastern France. His father is a cloth merchant, and the family is well off. Sedan is one of the towns captured by German troops during their advance on Paris in the summer of 1914. Since then, a German military administration has governed the occupied territories. Initially, the Germans tried to keep life there as normal as possible. Now they resort to increasingly drastic measures to wring as much benefit as possible from these conquered territories. They devise and impose more and more new taxes and duties on them. For the occupied French, the Germans are seen as Huns or Bosch. Wenn Sie nicht deklarierte Lebensmittel verstecken, müssen Sie mit einer schweren Bestrafung rechnen. There's a long list of things the Bosch took from the villagers. Money, vitrines, bed sheets, coal, flour, wood, leeks, coffee, chicory, sugar, cigarettes. Si les Allemands découvrent votre plan, qu'ils vont être furieux. Die Stadt Sedan hat außerdem die Auflage, eine Million Mark an Reparationskosten zu bezahlen. Les Allemands réclament un million de marques à la ville de Sedan. Oui, nous sommes au courant. C'est terrible, it's terrible. Frenchmen robbed of money that would be used to help kill their compatriots. Papa, l'argent, on leur donne pas. Was sagt er? Die Familie sichert volle Kooperation zu. Das ist gut. Denn um die Bürger von Sedan anzuspornen, werden wir eine gewisse Anzahl erwachsener Männer so lange festhalten, bis die Summe vollständig bezahlt ist. Les Allemands menacent de prendre des otages si la ville ne paie pas. Beginnen wir also mit der Feststellung sämtlicher männlicher Personen in diesem Haushalt. Il veut savoir combien d'hommes vivent dans cette maison. Nous. Trois. Seewerk, Abmarsch! At the beginning of 1917, the occupied areas of France and Belgium, as well as former Russian-held territory in Poland, are subjected to a regime of systematic plunder. The military administration squeezes every last resource from these peoples in order to supply the German population with food and commodities. From the perspective of the occupying powers, there is no other choice. Germany, Austria, Hungary, and their allies have far fewer resources than their opponents. The British naval blockade has further worsened this imbalance. Sieh genau hin, wie ich das mache. Wir haben von allen zu wenig. Wenn du einen Fehler machst, hungern die Kleinen noch schlimmer als eh schon. I have been assigned to the night watch at the nursery. Work begins at 6 p.m. and ends at 6 a.m. Jedes Kind bekommt seine eigene Milchzusammensetzung. Manchmal aber auch nur Reis oder Haferschleim oder Tee. Die Liste ist hier. Bring in keinem Fall die Nummern durcheinander. I'm afraid of the milk kitchen. How easily one could make a mistake through tiredness. Hier ist das Telefon. Da kannst du im schlimmsten Fall das städtische Krankenhaus anrufen. Aber das Krankenhaus ist ziemlich weit weg. I'm also afraid of being alone at night. There's nobody else here, only the children and me. And when Einbrecher come, what do I do then? Hardship and shortages hit the weak and the most vulnerable particularly hard. 
a series of crop failures in Germany and Austria-Hungary further exacerbate the crisis. There are shortages not only of food, but also of wood and coal, as people struggle to survive the year's particularly harsh winter. People employ all kinds of ingenious methods to try to remedy the situation. They get little help from their leaders. Any substantial resources are earmarked for the army and for arms production. On the home front, the only thing in constant supply is hunger. Die bisschen Kohlen, die ich habe, die brauche ich wirklich für mich selbst. Tut mir leid. Ohne Heizung, ohne Kochen, weiß ich nicht, wie ich den Winter überstehen soll. Warum gehen Sie nicht dahin zurück, wo Sie hergekommen sind? In Australien ist doch jetzt Sommer. Die Behörde verbietet es mir. Die lassen keine Ausländer aus dem Land. Es sei denn, sie sind sterbenskrank. Sie sagen, ich könnte eine Spionin sein. Hm. Was um Himmels Willen würden Sie denn hier in Leipzig ausspionieren? Wie schlecht es den Leuten hier geht? <lacht> Nicht gut. Ich rufe einen Arzt für Sie. Auf keinen Fall. Wie soll ich den denn bezahlen? Wenn Sie Glück haben, schreibt er Ihnen ein Attest, dass Sie wegen Ihrer Gesundheit nicht in Deutschland bleiben können. Sein, dann fahren wir ja nach Osten. Nach Osten? Aber das heißt, wir fahren nach Sibirien. Schlimmer geht's ja nicht. Nein, nein, das heißt, dass die Unsrigen gewinnen. Die, die rücken immer weiter vor mit der Front. Die haben vielleicht schon Moskau eingenommen. Das heißt, wir sind bald frei. Karl, bitte, wir fahren nach Sibirien! Today we heard the father is on the list of people who may soon be taken hostage. Aïe! Papa, il faut pas que tu restes ici. Votre fils a raison. Ce dent a payé le milieu réclamé. Il ne s'agit pas de cela. Les Allemands ont besoin de travailleurs parce que tous les hommes sont partis à la guerre. Tu dois faire ta valise. Il n'en est pas question. Ils se vengeront sur vous. Ou prendront un autre à ma place. Qu'est-ce qu'ils vont faire de toi Peut-être que j'irai en Allemagne, qui sait Mais pour l'instant, ce n'est qu'une liste. Hein Et la guerre sera terminée avant qu'ils nous envoient travailler chez eux. Comment on dit merde en allemand Trek. Trek für Deutsch. Trek für Deutsch. Dreck für Deutsch. Gesund sind Sie nicht. Einzweilen verschreibe ich Ihnen. Ich brauche eine medizinische Bescheinigung. Für Ihre Arbeit? Für die Polizei. Da sieht der Fall etwas anders aus. Gesund sind Sie zwar nicht, wie ich schon sagte, Aber wer ist das schon heutzutage? Ich muss hier raus. Bitte. Tut mir leid. Ein schönes Stück. Ich wollte, ich könnte wieder mehr Klavier spielen. Leider ist mein Piano so kaputt, dass es wohl nicht mehr zu reparieren ist. Wollen Sie es haben? Sind Sie sicher? Wenn ich es recht bedenke, verlangen Ihre nervöse Konstitution, Ihre Neigung zu Blutarmut und Ihre schwache Lunge einen Kuraufenthalt. Sagen wir in der Schweiz. Malnutrition and the severe cold lead to an outbreak of disease and pestilence 
on a scale not seen in Europe for centuries. In the turnip winter of 1916-17, the food supplies were exhausted. The sick and the crippled were left to fend for themselves. The death rates among the civilian populations of Germany and Austria-Hungary begin to soar. Adults lose on average 10 to 15 kilograms in weight during this winter, and many simply perish. The infant mortality rate reaches dramatic new levels. There are shortages of food, doctors, and staff. Tens of thousands of children starve to death. Volunteers conduct a desperate campaign to save the lives of those in their care, though it's clear from the beginning those who will not survive. Oh, these are babies. Oh, these babies. Oh, Their skin and bones, tiny starved bodies. Their oh, eyes are oh, so God. big. <laughs> and seen me Some look like you know. living mummies. When they cry, it sounds like weak squawking. <laughs> suddenly twists his whole body and his arms shake. He turned his neck and suddenly lay still and stiff in my arms. If only the war would end, I could be glad then to die, dear God. The cavalry horses held in reserve by the military authorities are being slaughtered for lack of food. And the people of Vienna are for a change to get a few mouthfuls of meat. Bread used to cost 10 groats, but we cannot afford it now. Mama bakes us ashen bread of potatoes and barley. It was meant to be enough for the whole family. It was not even enough for one. I often cry because I am so hungry. As no food was to be found, people were forced to eat whatever they could. Soon, not a single cat, dog, or crow was to be seen. Even mice and rats soon disappeared. They are mere shadows, not people. They are skeletons, not men. He was a war child and died a victim of it. This happened something. There was no medical help available. Nobody cared for us. Because of this, disease was rampant. Half the men died of typhoid fever. What kind of and none of those poor souls received a proper burial. I cried so much over poor little Gerhard. Now I give myself up to die so that this war may end. If a child, for is that not what I am, is willing to make this sacrifice, then surely you will not let this war go on. It's 
Lass mir ernst, Dear God, I am serious, as I pray you are. Ja auch. Großmutchen. Grandmother is at Frau Leonard's for coffee and won't be back for three hours. Everything is quiet here. Keep your word, dear God, for I am keeping mine. This is my solemn vow. Holzmehl. Aber ich hatte doch etwas echten Zucker. Was ist denn mit Ihrem schönen Geschirr passiert? Habe ich dafür eingetauscht. Aber ist das nicht ziemlich rechtfertig? Es gibt was zu feiern. Ich muss mich bei der Polizei melden. Es kann nur heißen, dass mein Ausreisegesuch in Berlin bewilligt worden ist. Und was passiert mit dem schönen Sofa und dem Sessel? Ich würde mich freuen, wenn Sie eine Verwendung dafür hätten. Guten Appetit. Most people become poorer during the war, but some become rich by it. Many banks and industrialists make huge profits through arms deals. But farmers, merchants and smugglers also profit from the war. Two new terms are coined in Germany, Rafkes or profiteer and goulash barons. The black market flourishes on all sides. Prices reach astronomical highs. Basic foodstuffs can cost 400 times more than it did in peacetime. State control and threats of imprisonment prove ineffective. The German army itself is eventually forced to trade with the black market in order to provision their troops. People's hatred of the profiteers is tempered by the fact that almost everyone is dependent on their services. People are so desperate that they will do anything to obtain life-sustaining goods. was difficult. My hand was still yeah. in a sling. Well, well, what's up? What's up? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Not a kind of swim, sir. We have not the eight kronen. We hold on the fishes was. I had eight kronen hidden in a small pouch hanging from around my neck. It was soaked with blood. The Russians must have thought it was something sacred, so they never tried to take it. On top is Mickey Lassen. Mother! 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 What's that, sir? Mother! 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 Мода, пожалуйста. Мода, держи. Воды у меня нет. Отстань. Often the train whistle would blow and we would move on with empty stomachs. The flat feels dreadfully empty and deserted. I'm more homesick than ever. And I'm beginning to loathe Leipzig. All that made me care for it has gone. The sort of dogged despair of the place and the people is getting on my nerves.
Les dernières heures ont sonné. The hour had come. Les derniers moments sont. Time to say goodbye. Le moment des hugs au revoir. and kisses. Fear and sorrow fill my heart. La peur et la douleur remplissent mon cœur. I want to cry. J'ai envie de pleurer. Attends. Si je ne devais pas revenir. Maintenant, c'est à toi de prendre soin de la famille. Hmm? Pleure pas. Ne pleure pas. Lorsqu'il est parti, father leaves, and it's suddenly very quiet in the house. Et tellement vide, so completely silent. Je veux tout laisser tomber. I feel like giving everything up. My diary. Everything. And just lying down to sleep, not to wake up again. Plus me réveiller. Until this war is over. Parce que la guerre soit finie. For the people of the occupied territories, the plundering of their supplies seemed to be unending. But there is now another raw material which is becoming increasingly scarce during the course of this war, people. French, Poles, and Belgians are deported to Germany to fill the gaps in the workforce there. This is a clear breach of international law. Without any hesitation, prisoners of war are utilized as forced labor. In Russia, prisoners are redistributed in their thousands all over the country. Wenn du so weit gefahren vielleicht sind wir bald in Vladivostok. Was meinst du, Sepp? Vielleicht kommen wir über Japan zu Hause. Hä? Sepp. Sepp. Das auch. Ja. Ich habe gedacht, ich bin in einer anderen Welt. Nein, Elfriede, du bist hier. Zum Glück bist du hier. Da koche ich ganz an ihre. I crawled close to her and rested my head on her chest and cried. Grandma pressed her head onto mine and cried as well. We cried and cried, and neither of us asking the other why we felt so miserable.
müssen wir Ihnen zu unserem Bedauern mitteilen, dass Ihrem Ausreisegesuch in die Schweiz nicht stattgegeben werden kann. Ein Widerspruch gegen diesen Bescheid ist nicht statthaft. Nineteen seventeen, the war enters its fourth year. Division lines between soldiers and civilians, between war fronts and home fronts, fade. Retreat is no longer possible. In this war, rules and boundaries no longer apply. This truly has become a world war. People have lost sight of what was and of what will be. Only one thing drives them on now, survival. Not only have homes, towns, and lives been destroyed by this war, so have dreams, beliefs, and hope.
Our world was one of law and order. There was always someone there to take us by the hand and show us the right path. Teachers, priests, officers, rulers. We knew our place, and we knew the difference between right and wrong. We weren't free, but we were free from fear. For us, the order of things seemed to be fixed that way permanently. Until the summer of 1914. Господин капитан, срочно телеграмма из штаба. Неужели мое шампанское приехало? Ваше благородие? Закрой дверь. Послушай, царь отрекся от престола. Понимаешь, что это означает? Революция. 17-летняя Марина Юрлова has been fighting for three years on the Caucasus front in southern Russia. This young woman is serving with a unit of Cossack soldiers whose loyalty is pledged unconditionally to the Tsar. But after millions of deaths and more and more defeats, the people's faith in the omnipotence of the Russian ruler has been deeply shaken. Rioting breaks out in February 1917 in the capital Petrograd, formerly known as St. Petersburg. The army is told to clear the people from the streets but the elite regiments join the rebellion. Dissatisfaction turns into a revolution. Ваше благородие, значит война окончена? Нет, девочка моя. Война продолжается. Я думала, что народ хочет мира. Вздор. Народ сам не знает, чего хочет. Если мне командовать, то все схатится в хаос. И кто будет теперь командовать, когда царя нет? Мы, Марина. Мы. Доставишь приказ в полк. Пусть готовится к наступлению. И чем раньше, тем лучше. Нет ничего более губительного для морального состояния войска, чем, чем время для размышления. Езжай. В 
The world of the Russian elite always seemed unshakable. The common people were expected to venerate, fear, and obey them. But now, everything was changing. In early March 1917, Tsar Nicholas II is forced to abdicate. Over 300 years of rule by the Romanov dynasty comes to an end. Workers and soldiers alike rejoice in the streets of Petrograd. Bourgeois liberal politicians form a provisional government. The provisional government confirms the alliance with England and France. But the governments in the West have one overriding concern, that the revolutionary fire in Russia could spread to their own countries. The old regime is undoubtedly gone. In both Petrograd and Moscow, the people are joyful. Everyone acclaims the new republic. Liberty, holy liberty is shouted out everywhere. With what joy we now write of the new Russian government. Only those who knew how things were only a week ago can understand. We have seen a miracle take place before our eyes. No human power can put Russia back where she was but a few weeks ago. The two peoples, Russia and America, hand in hand, will show the way of happiness to nations great and small. The Russian Revolution is the first sign of hope to reach this poor, blood-soaked nation since the outbreak of the war, the first ray of a spring sun that promises the arrival of flowers. For me, it was clear that we would lose the war if we took the revolution forward prematurely. That would have had grave consequences. As I rode away, my mind played with the sickly thought that I was carrying a death message. And it seemed that not the officer, but I myself, was sending these soldiers into a costly battle, and that if I had the courage, I should tear the dispatch up and ride away into the hills. You could look all around you and see nothing but blank eyes, red-rimmed and burning, shaky hands slouched backs, and it was not so much that they stumbled forward as shambled forward. Ну что, солдат? Теперь назад в штаб. Я с вами в атаку. rules are made and we have to enforce them. Searching incoming workers for matches, cigarettes, spirits. Keeping guard at the gate and allowing no one to enter without a pass. Patrolling to see there is no larking or slacking. We take turns at all these various jobs, none of which were taught us during training. Show me your coat pockets, please. You'll have to take a look yourself, Missy. Why are you worried you get your uniform dirty? It's a pity, Mary Morgan. I thought we were on friendly terms. None of my friend wears a uniform. Look here, Missy's trying to fondle me. I ain't got time for all this. Duty calls and all that. Stay there, Mary. If the factory were to go up in flames, then I guess it'd go up in flames. You think anybody would care? 25 year old Gabrielle West is from a well off family in southwestern England. She wants to serve her country and welcomes any new challenges. 
She becomes a police officer in a munitions factory in Wales, an unthinkable job for a woman prior to the war. But in 1916, Britain deploys its first female police force. Their task is to keep the hundreds of thousands of female workers in the new munitions factories under control. The army's hunger for shells is insatiable. The working conditions in the arms industry can be lethal. Accidents are a daily occurrence, and proper safety measures in the workplace are unheard of. The women who work in these factories put their lives at risk each and every day. What's going on here, Miss West? Everything is in order, sir. Nonsense. This young lady refused to let you search her. This kind of behavior calls for consequences. You know, Mr. Anderson, it would be better for the girls to have a longer break so as they might smoke in peace outside the front gate. A longer break? Shall we send that message to our men in the field when they run out of shells? Tell them we're sorry, but we had to take longer breaks to go and smoke. Sir, all I meant was... Enough. Now, you can leave, Mr. Sir. Just leave. Out! For heaven's sake, Miss West. You have an official role here. Don't let them take advantage of you. Off you go. The girls here are recruited in batches, some from the Midlands, some from Yorkshire, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. They are brought down here and are put into very rough hostels or cheap lodgings. Naturally, under these circumstances, only the roughest of the rough will come. So I'm rather afraid it is the girls who won't let us take advantage of them. Oh, no, no, Miss West. This isn't Russia. I can't see a revolution breaking out around here. <laughs> Understood. Mm. I hope not, sir. I hope not. As the Tsar is toppled in Russia, Germany orders its navy to wage unrestricted submarine warfare. German U-boats are instructed to attack without warning all ships in British waters. The aim is to starve Britain into submission and to exact revenge for the increasingly effective British naval blockade. From February 1917 onwards, countless British ships are sunk, as well as merchant ships from neutral powers, including many American vessels. The first weeks of Germany's use of submarines proves highly effective. The enormous loss of ships creates a serious threat to Great Britain's food supply. For the first time, the British population faces the very real threat of starvation. By mid-March 1917, Britain hasn't enough food left to last for six weeks. So, what is it this time? They refuse to work, so long as Mary Morgan isn't reinstated. Who is this, sir? Uh, Mary Morgan? The girl from the entrance, Kate. The one you dismissed, sir. The one I had to dismiss because of your quarrel with her. Right, ladies. Our dear sweet Miss West simply made a mistake and we'll apologize to you for it. Then you can all Get back to work. No, sir. With all due respect, I will not apologize. Don't you ever dare call me sweet again. Things would be far better around here if you would please ensure that the girls no longer need fear the rats when they visit the lavatories. That their overalls don't fall apart before they're even put on. That 20 or 30 girls do not end up fainting every day. Yeah! Yeah! Это не защищи казак. Солдатики мои ослабли совсем. Последнее время нам вместо боеприпасов только вон ящики боеприпасы мешают. Это точно ничего от царя не слышал? А? Только уверена в том, что капитан приказал идти в атаку. Понятно. Говорят, 
touch the Cossacks. But with a growing sense of disillusion came fear. Cossacks are not supposed to know what fear means. It was less a fear of death than a fear of something which we could not hope to understand. Monsieur, il y a deux semaines, j'ai effectué une ronde jusqu'au poste 10. Le soldat Madec ici présent était de garde. Et j'ai pu constater que sa posture n'était pas du tout réglementaire. Il avait surpris le petit breton. Il avait surpris le breton qui avait fallu dans le sleep pendant la garde duty. Peut-être qu'il avait dreamé de sa girlfriend, whose picture il avait été si proud de show me. Il était bien présent physiquement à son poste, mais l'esprit ne l'était pas. Merci, capitaine Udell. Un tel manquement à la discipline ne peut être toléré sur les lignes du front. Messieurs. Oui, c'était une faute. Mais la mienne également, car je n'aurais pas dû lui confier la garde du petit poste. Le soldat est trop jeune, c'est un orphelin totalement épuisé. Je vous prie de ne pas le condamner trop sévèrement. Mon général, nous avons déjà évoqué, il me semble que nous soyons du même avis, le soldat Madec a besoin d'une sanction sévère dont il se souviendra. On ne peut épargner personne, jeune ou pauvre. Pour la discipline de la troupe, nous avons besoin d'exemples. Des exemples Madec a tout juste 17 ans. Il a devancé l'appel. 38-year-old Louis Bartas was a socialist before the war and a pacifist. Following the German invasion, he defended his country at Verdun as a non-commissioned officer. After three years of unbroken fighting, the troops are at the end of their tether. The enemy still occupies large parts of northern France, and their front remains impenetrable. The French army's leaders have to justify to a war-weary public that the millions of dead soldiers have not fallen in vain. The commander-in-chief, General Joffre, is ousted. New generals promise new major offensives. But first, every supposed weakness within their army is to be eradicated using every means possible. L'état-major se doit de faire un exemple. Au moment où l'armée entière exige de chaque homme un ultime effort, il m'avait promis que ce serait qu'une sanction disciplinaire comme d'habitude. Il m'avait promis. Every day, court martials sentence boys who dare to doubt our eventual victory. What punishment would these inhuman generals themselves receive? Who, while well protected in their staff buildings, are the cause of our defeats and who waste so many soldiers' lives. In every army, it is the task of a court martial to discipline soldiers with harsh punishment. I've endured an experience that I will never forget for as long as I live. Six of my comrades and I had to shoot dead a member of our own company. He was stood up on a rock, and we pulled our triggers. Then we had to take aim. My hands were shaking so much, so I aimed about a foot to his left. Only one shot caught him in the side. He slumped forward, wounded, so I was not the only one firing wide deliberately. The captain walked up to him and put a bullet into his head. I cannot describe how devastating this was for me. A terrible death, without drums or trumpets. The colonel told us to return to our duties, but none of us felt like cleaning our rifles or eating soup. Punishment and executions cannot stem this pervasive war weariness. More and more soldiers desert or use night patrols as an opportunity to surrender to the enemy. This sort of dishonorable behavior would have been unthinkable at the beginning of this war. 
Now, it's becoming a mass phenomenon. After the February Revolution, Russian soldiers in particular see no reason to continue fighting. More than a million of them voluntarily allow themselves to be captured. For weeks, I have been living side by side with the slowest and the most horrible way to die, starvation. We had nothing to do there but wait for orders that never came and watch the people die around us or desert us. Eccolo il nostro americano pazzo. Benvenuto nell'ospedale psichiatrico militare di Santo Svaldo. Sono il dottor Grassi. Posso esserti amico oppure uno dei tuoi peggiori incubi? Faccio abbastanza incubi per conto mio, dottore. Vediamo un po'. Non ti va più di fare il salvatore dell'Italia? Ma per l'appunto sto cercando di salvarla l'Italia. Ah sì? E come pensi di riuscirci? Pratico la pace, semplice. Ah, la pace, bene. Intanto Giovanni e Edoardo cominceranno col darti una rinfrescata. Farà sicuramente un po' troppo caldo dalle nostre parti per voi americani. The 24-year-old Vincenzo D'Aquila had left New York City to fight as a volunteer for his former homeland. Italy entered the war in order to liberate the Trentino region and the port city of Trieste from Austrian rule. But vicious battles on the border at the river Isonzo do nothing except kill and wound millions. For many soldiers, the only way to escape the endless fighting is as a cripple, with either physical or emotional burdens that they'll carry for the rest of their lives. Men without arms or legs are celebrated as heroes, but those who've been traumatized by the horrors of battle are considered malingerers or cowards. Doctors are ordered to make them fit for the front and then to send them back there. Allora, sei tu il Cristo? To be asked the question, art thou Christ? Point blank, of course, disconcerted me for the moment. What is this, thought I? Am I Christ? And is the second coming being accomplished via the insane asylum? I thought hard for a minute. What a fool he was, was my first reaction. Since he wished to be deceived, it might be well worth deceiving him in order to see how far their folly would carry him. But my better angel prompted me not to lower myself to such depths. D'accordo. Se non sei il Cristo, allora non sei che un altro vigliacco e simulatore nel mio ospedale. Military doctors view the psychological victims of the war as malingerers and weaklings. But millions of men are suffering from panic attacks, shell shock, and uncontrollable trembling induced by warfare. Their condition is kept secret from the public, and little effective treatment is provided. 
Most of these soldiers are sent back to the front. In view of their condition, this is a death sentence. The scene unfolding to my vision was depressing in the extreme. I was surprised and shocked to see several very pitiable derelicts of war. Two of the men to my right were victims of a chronic nightmare. They lived under the hallucination that their bodies were covered with the blood of the trenches. So, Vincenzo, salute i tuoi nuovi camerati. Metà di loro sono matti e l'altra metà sono dei maledetti simulatori. He was a young man who was subject at periodic intervals to an epileptic fit in which he repeated crawling along the hospital floor. As in his trench, culminating in the war cry, Avanti Savoia. Questo è un ospedale militare. E tu e tutti gli altri qui siete sempre dei soldati. E ciò significa che siete. Sottoposti alle leggi marziali. Se scopro qualcuno di voi che sta simulando, lo mando in un posto, direi, poco accogliente, al fronte. Non ci tornerò mai più al fronte. Mai più! Che vigliacco che sei. Hm? Io ho due figli al fronte e sono fiero di loro, come ogni vero italiano. Invece dovrebbe mostrarsi come un vero padre, dottore. È da avere paura. Avanti! 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 On April 6, 1917, the USA declares war on Germany. Unrestricted submarine warfare and the loss of numerous American vessels have provoked a wave of anger and patriotism. Millions of Americans enlist for duty. Germany, the hotbed of militarism, must be defeated in order to defend the freedom of all nations. Now, the most powerful economy in the world is allied with the countries of the Triple Entente. However, the U.S. Army has little combat experience or sufficiently modern warfare equipment. As U.S. soldiers land in France, they receive a euphoric welcome. But disillusion quickly sets in. By the end of April 1917, just a few thousand soldiers have entered the war zone, and they're far from ready for battle. The French generals don't want to wait until their new allies are ready to fight alongside them. The generals commit their exhausted soldiers to a major offensive against the strongest German positions on the entire front, alone. Grâce à notre très cher général Nivelle, leur corps pourrit sur le chemin des dames. Caporal, préparez vos hommes. Demain matin, nous passons à l'offensive. Allez, Bartas, ne faites pas l'idiot. Prenez vos affaires. Et vous pourriez au moins saluer un officier. C'est toujours l'armée française ici. L'armée française Une armée qui envoie ses hommes à la boucherie. The major offensive plan by the new French commander-in-chief, General Nouvelle, turns out to be a catastrophe. This offensive against German positions in the Champagne and Picardy regions, the biggest French attack of the war thus far, was supposed to be his prelude to marching on Berlin. Instead, 30,000 French die within a few weeks without achieving even the slightest breakthrough against the Germans. <laughs> Il a la gueule dans la boue On est marre de voir nos frères tomber l'un après l'autre. Quand est-ce que ça va se terminer cette boucherie L'éruption de la fin du passé, faisons table rase, pour l'esclave debout, debout. Le monde va changer de base, nous ne sommes rien, soyons tout. C'est la lutte finale, nous pour nous et demain. La terre.
Every day, we read warnings against frequenting cafes while our commanders were swimming in debauchery and drunkenness. Officers come in daily with cases of syphilis, gonorrhea, and cancroids. The poor girls must have felt flattered to be chatted up by these pestilent pigs in their spotless uniforms. The innocent face of our lieutenant seemed far more sinister to me now. I could not understand this reckless waste of human lives. He was a man of supreme egoism and utter lack of scruple, who, to his overweening ambition, sacrificed hundreds of thousands of men. Our officers are murderers, murderers who are leading us to the slaughterhouse. Так точно ваше благородие, понятно? Знаете что, гражданин? После революции мы сами можем выбирать себе командира. Так что смотрите. Выберем ли мы вас? <гас> Господин капитан Росынский, ваше благородие, помогите. Похоже, меня укусила крыса. Посмотрите, пожалуйста. Что там еще? Благородие, вы не можете так кричать на людей. Это опасно. Я вас умоляю. Пожалуйста, говорите с ними учтиво. Подпросите их. Я должен просить своих солдат? Да, господин капитан. Такое положение дел. Tsar overthrown, fewer and fewer of Russia's soldiers want to keep on fighting. At the front, there are refusals to obey orders and entire units disband. But their army's leaders want to continue the war at any price. In Petrograd, a charismatic new leader emerges. Germany's military secret service smuggles Vladimir Ilyich Lenin out of exile in Switzerland to Russia. His supporters, the communist Bolsheviks, promised the Russian people immediate and unconditional peace, without victory and without conquests. It's an unthinkable idea to those in power throughout Europe. <laughs> I acclimated myself to the place at once. When one is looked upon as hallucinated, the best thing to do is to behave accordingly and begin to live a life of make-believe. I accustomed myself to a belief that I was a member of a very select and exclusive club. Brezio, alzati, vieni. Saluta gli amici. Sei fortunato. Devi tornare il fronte. E vediamo quale sarà il prossimo bugiardo che smaschero. Decisi. I decided that the time had come to do something. Dichiaro! I declare now to all men, to all doctors, all soldiers, I am not crazy! I swear it on my life! I know what I'm doing! I will not take part in this war anymore! I know it's cowardice to abandon my fellow soldiers! So I am a coward, and I will stay a coward. And if I break partial, will not shoot me. But I will not go back to the front. Never. This war is the biggest crime I have ever known. In times so extremely out of joint, perhaps the madhouse was the sanest place to live after all. And terrible strike again. More violent than the last. And as usual, for more pain, less work. The girls stormed around, yelled, shrieked, threw stones, and so on. 
The strike has knocked down a police woman who prevented them from getting at the changing room. Then they went to the main offices and broke all the windows, demanding to see the manager. Capitaine, vous seriez prêt à battre vos propres camarades. Si vous n'arrêtez pas tout cela bientôt, on vous fusillera tous de toute façon. Ne vous en faites pas pour nous, on n'est que des morts en sursis. Allez, ouvrez cette porte, on doit discuter. Vous pouvez garantir ma sécurité Tout ce que je peux vous dire, c'est que vous en sortirez pas si vous n'ouvrez pas cette porte. Police work. You know very well this uniform is just a pretty facade. We have no rights, no authority, no chance against 4,000 furious working girls. Well, perhaps you should have considered that earlier. No, sir. Perhaps you should have considered earlier whether you really ought to extend our working hours, despite all our warnings. Do you think I'm doing this for my own pleasure? The army's planning a new offensive, and wants twice as many shells as before. Has that ever crossed your sweet little mind? I told you before, I'm not your sweet young lady. Consider this my resignation. In the summer and autumn of 1917, hundreds of thousands of women working in Great Britain's munitions factories go on strike. Unrest and revolt grip most of the warring countries in Europe and beyond. The French, Italians, and Australians are just as unwilling as the Germans and Austrians to endure hunger and inhumane working conditions without complaint. The protesters seldom call for an end to the war. Instead, they call for an immediate end to hardship, degradation, and senseless sacrifice. La paix du cimetière, c'est ça qu'il mérite, ces sales officiers. Hey les gars, je discute de nos membres avec Monsieur le Capitaine. Laissez-nous un peu la paix, vous voulez bien Ouais. Oh, Calme-toi un peu. Mes camarades, nous sommes toujours prêts à sacrifier nos vies pour la patrie. Mais nous disons qu'il y a longtemps que l'heure des permissions a sonné et nous exigeons d'être traités avec plus de respect. C'est ça Et terminer les grandes offensives ouais, ouais, Qu'on en ouais, finisse ouais, avec toutes ces attaques ouais, ouais, ça, ça, Pour les permissions, ça, au moins, on peut en discuter. J'en suis certain. Faites passer cette note à vos supérieurs, mon capitaine. Et pour votre propre sécurité, je vous conseille de ne pas revenir avant que ce dont on ait compris ce qui se passe ici. The French soldiers' rebellion spreads within a few weeks to 60 divisions. More than half a million men. At times, the trenches are left barely capable of being defended. The mutineers challenge the until now unquestioned logic of coercion, obedience, and the loss of human life. The French army is threatening to disintegrate. A compromise must be made with the insurgents. The hated General Nivelle is ousted. Countless punishments and sentences are imposed on the mutineers, but few of them are actually carried out. The most important compromise is to finally offer the exhausted troops rest and recuperation. All plans for further offensives are suspended. Posso farvi fucilare tutti. 
Avanti, Potrei però ripensarci. Avanti! Se alcuni di voi decidessero di offrirsi volontari per tornare al fronte... Bene. Niente da mangiare a tutto il dormitorio. E rassettate tutto questo porcino. E per quanto riguarda il vostro capo... Niente da mangiare. Al buio. E in cella di sicurezza. La prossima volta che ci vedremo sarà per darti i documenti per rispedirti al fronte. Non ci dono al fronte, non ci dono. Non ci dono al fronte. Ti ti rasbuju. Порвемся. Только зачем? Захватим чужие земли и не для себя. Порешим крестьян, таких же, как мы сами. И все для чего? Для новых наград он на груди. Ehi tu, Vincenzo, pazzo profeta, perché non sei rimasto in America? È quello che mi chiedo ogni giorno, dottore. Credo che ho una missione. Since the French army is no longer combat worthy after its mutinies, France's allies must now bear the main burden of any new offensive. British brigades with troop support from Canada, Australia and New Zealand are to attack Germany's positions in Flanders by the hundreds of thousands in the second half of 1917. Once again, the word is that this offensive will be the war's last. The goal is to break through the Belgian front line at Ypres and push on through to the Channel Coast. The objectives are the naval bases in the Belgian city of Ostend, from where the German submarines launch their attacks. In order to make it impossible for Germany to transfer reserve troops from the Eastern Front, the new Russian government must continue the war. The Russian army begins another large offensive in Galicia, and Bukovina. Workers, mothers and fathers, Widows and orphans, wounded and maimed, across all borders and on smoldering battlefields, through ruined cities and villages. We appeal to all those who suffer from war. Workers of all countries, unite. They didn't take me with me.
Allora, dottore, sarà il fronte alla fucilazione. Dottore. Tutti e due. Scomparsi. E i figli, tutti e due. Maledetto caporetto. At Caporetto, on October 1917, the Austrians and Germans inflicted devastating defeat on the Italian army. During the battle, Italy loses in just two days the territorial gains it had secured over the last two years, along with almost all of northeastern Italy itself. Very few are willing to give up their lives for a war of conquest. Hundreds of thousands opt instead for capture or desert the army entirely. Once the front line is broken, though, more than 10,000 die within a few days. Ecco la conclusione della mia diagnosi, del tuo caso. Giudico che ci troviamo davanti ad un disturbo mentale di lunga durata. Una dimissione non è possibile. Vorrei tanto abbracciarla, dottore, ma con la camicia di forza non è possibile. Tra l'altro vorrei bere. Il mondo lì fuori è completamente impazzito. Preferiamo tenere la gente sana qui dentro, dove non gli può accadere niente. Trenches that disappeared, pillboxes and shell holes took the place. There was no longer any sustaining feeling that all this slaughter was leading us to anything. No one could see any purpose in it. More and more people left the battlefield and walked right past us. Many of them had no injuries, but had simply thrown away their rifles. I am tired of commanding men who have simply had enough. My men aren't bad. They're just sick of it all. I myself, I'm completely through with it. Now. This blasted war, damn those that thought it up, and above all, damn those who declared it. I'm tired of the fighting. I'm tired of this miserable, humiliating war. I'm in a rotten mood. And the troops, even more so. Worrying rumors abound about a retreat. It seems all is lost. The Russian offensive ends after just a few days with the collapse of its entire front. Millions of men refuse to fight, switch to the enemy side, or simply head back home. In Petrograd, the Bolsheviks seize control in October of 1917. The provisional government is chased out of office, and an immediate end to the war is declared. Anywhere that officers or representatives of the old guard refuse to recognize the new government, the masses strike back with great fury. <laughs> Братцы, что же вы делаете? Мой дед, мой прадед, мой отец, все любили Россию. Я тоже люблю Россию. За это вы меня хотите убить? Солдата, я требую, чтобы вы меня отпустили! Требуют! Это, это штабная крыса! Еще что-то от нас требует! А? Пока мы там! На поле боя сражались, не, не щадили живота своего, сражались там на поле сражения. А ну, отсиживался в тылу теперь. Он что-то от нас еще требует. 
Сейчас я покажу, товарищи, что я сделал с этой... Stay up with I told myself over and over again that nothing in my whole experience of war could equal a murder like this. And yet if these soldiers had a thirst for blood, it was the dead general and his kind who had given it to them. And if I had just seen a man die miserably, he had probably ordered thousands of men into no less miserable a death. We could scarcely remember a life without war. It was now four long years that we had fought, suffered, and killed. And still, without any end to it in sight, our whole world was one great battlefield, both at the front and at home. We had long forgotten the ideals for which we had originally fought. It was only about two things now, total victory or total defeat. Peace was beyond memory. <laughs> Had it ever even existed? War was our only reality now. And it seemed it would never end.
exhilarating in a way, to feel that we truly are at the razor's edge of fortune. This is not merely a fight in which the only question is at what date we shall win. In all our old wars, the wars in the colonies, we were not really putting a fair stake on the table, so to speak, because we could not possibly be destroyed by defeat, but only mortified a little. All the moral trial of the possibility of destruction was left to the other side, but now... The enemy is at the gates. Fifteen minutes to pack up and leave. I'm ready. On the 3rd of March, 1918, in the Russian fortress city of Brest-Litovsk, a delegation of German and Austrian generals had arrived. They were greeted by the revolutionary leader, Leon Trotsky. A peace treaty is signed. The conditions are wide-ranged and humiliating, and not just from the Russian perspective. Under the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, German and Austrian troops occupy Finland, the Baltic countries, the whole of Ukraine, and the Crimea. These areas include 1.4 million square kilometers and approximately 60 million people, a third of the total population of the former empire of the Tsar. This treaty will prove to be unacceptable and peace seems to be unattainable. Each state is now more convinced than ever that only a total defeat of the enemy can end this war. In its struggle against imperialism, the proletariat cannot fall back upon the old maps of Europe. The prosperity of the Russian Revolution lies in its expansion throughout the whole of Europe. What is my aim for this war? My aim is resounding victory. I am conducting a war. I believe the complete victory can only be obtained by continuing the war until we force unconditional surrender from Germany. There is no halfway house between victory and defeat. Victory is an essential condition for the security of a free world. The enemy must emerge so weakened from this war that it is impossible for him to rise again as a major power. Germany hurries fresh troops into action on the Western Front. For the first time since the outbreak of war, the Germans have superiority of numbers there. On March 21st, they commence Operation Mikhail. 1.4 million soldiers are to take the British positions near Saint-Quentin in northern France. The fire was more violent than anything I had experienced in any other battle. The noise was unbelievable, apocalyptic. Then the moment arrived when the barrage ended. We made our move. This time, I look towards the battle with a sense of lethargy. It's as if I'm no longer a part of my own life or death. Then if I have to leave this world, there are only two things I would miss, my family and nature. 23-year-old Ernst Jünger is, despite his youth, one of the most experienced commanders on the Western Front. During four years of war, he has risen from the lowest ranks to become a lieutenant and stormtroop leader. Because of his bravery, he enjoys an almost legendary reputation amongst his troops. The military have taken control of state and society in Germany since 1917. Kaiser Wilhelm is now merely a figurehead for the real holders of power. The generals that surround Field Marshal Hindenburg. These generals gamble everything on this new offensive. Germany's last reserves are thrown into battle. The enemy lines with a mixture of bloodthirstiness, rage, and alcohol. Open fire! 
With it fueled on by these things, I felt the irrepressible need to kill. Please don't. Oh, oh God. Oh, I won't. I won't do anything. You English son of a bitch. Dang. An Englishman was cowering in the middle of the trench. He held up a photograph. It was of a girl and at least a half dozen children. I was glad that I overcame my mad rage and walked past him. The offensive is an overwhelming success which surprises the Germans almost as much as the British. Within hours, the German troops take objectives for which they had fought in vain for, for years. The German stormtroopers bypass pockets of resistance and force their way into the enemy's rear lines. After a few days, the offensive has pushed forward over 60 kilometers. Sir, with all due respect, would now not be the time for me to resume active service? Let's move more quickly. No more documents in the car. Yes, sir. I mean at the front, sir. Do you know where the front is, Montague? Because certainly nobody here can tell me that. Well, sir, we could wait here until they reach the gates and then fight. When was the last time you looked at yourself in the mirror? You're an old man. Oh, if you really must. Stay for a couple of hours and ensure that all the documents are duly destroyed. With pleasure, sir. Sir, we really should be leaving now. Don't stay too long. And don't let the Germans snap you off, old boy. Now, off. It seems we are as men wrecked upon a sand. That look to be washed off by the next tide. It is the first time I have seen the rear of a retreating army, or felt the curious tingle there is in an atmosphere where the enemy may appear at any time. If the Germans used all their strength now, with all their generalship on this front, not even our men could save our generals. The asses would go down with the lions they had tried to lead. At 52 years of age, Charles Edward Montague is technically too old for active service. However, he holds the rank of captain and works as chief censor for British military intelligence. His unit is housed in an elegant chateau at Rolancourt. This is where the British Army's five official war correspondents write their articles, which are then checked by the censors. Up until now, their workplace was safe and well behind the front line. As a result of the German spring offensive, the chateau is now in the combat zone and must be evacuated. Officers left here. Wouldn't happen to have a corkscrew on you, would you? Corkscrew? Stand up straight, would you, man? Oh, never mind. What's all this then? <laughs> well, uh, seems to me you're one of those desk officers, all ironed uniform and all. <laughs> Don't think you've got much to say to me. I wouldn't take that chance if I were you, Private. Be careful, sir. You might hurt yourself. Right, lads. <laughs> now, gentlemen, drink up your champagne, and then get a grip of yourselves and start behaving like Englishmen. Have some. Okay. Nearly all the divisions which have been in battle are now mere shadows, with a quarter to a half of their strength left, and those dead beat. This is the worst defeat for the British Army since the war began. The soldiers fall back. They need to hang on until American troops from overseas arrive as their reinforcement. 
For more than 75,000 British soldiers, the war is already over. They have been taken prisoner and are at the mercy of their captors. Kozákská svíňa. Marina Yurlova celebrates her 18th birthday in a prison at Kazan on the River Volga. She fought for the Tsar as a volunteer in a Cossack unit against Russia's enemies. But the Tsar has been overthrown, and the revolutionary Bolsheviks are the country's new rulers. The old Russian army is a shadow of its former self, its military strength almost gone. Conscription has been abolished, but the Bolsheviks still have to maintain their newly acquired power. A new force is created by arming the workers and the peasants, the Red Army. It takes action against internal enemies, which include the Cossacks because of their loyalty to the Tsar. Many are sentenced to death. By promising peace, the Bolsheviks have abolished the old order. Now, with the help of the masses, they want to build an entirely new form of their society, a communist one. However, the Bolsheviks are still the minority in Russia. They have the support of only a quarter of the population. Tsarist loyalists, conservatives, social democrats, and anarchists all oppose the Bolsheviks in a struggle for power. Whoever stands in the way of the Bolsheviks soon experiences the full force of their revolutionary terror. Не убивайся так, Марина. Расстреляют, ну и что? Это не так страшно, как кажется. Он самый. Павший за батюшку царя и матушку Россию. И за тебя тоже. Кося, я так боюсь смерти. Я так боюсь, Кося. Не бойся. Все когда-нибудь умирают. Но твоя смерть была такой бессмысленной. Все было бы одна большая ложь. За царя, за Россию. Все этого больше нет. Моя смерть. Девочка, знаешь, там, где я сейчас, миллионы. Миллионы погибших. И все их смерти были бессмысленны. Так что одной смерти больше, одной меньше. Не играет никакой роли. England, was, Pripke? Das ist ein sehr gutes Weißbrot, Herr Leutnant. So was habe ich schon seit Jahren nicht mehr gesehen. Bei keinem You would never have encountered such waste in Germany. Corn beef. Da, 
Besser geht's doch gar nicht. Da war eine ganze Kiste. Oh. Four entire boxes filled with eggs, onions, tomatoes, coffee, croissants, jams. In short, everything a starving soldier could ever dream of. Das ist ja wie bei Mutter hier. Ja, komm rein. Komm rein hier. Wir werden wahnsinnig, wenn ihr das hier seht. Hier, Junge. Hier, hier, hier. Hier ist genug für alle. Hier, hier, hier. Hier, du. Jawohl. Nimm, 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 nimm. Hier, hier ist genug für alle. For two years, German troops at the front have been suffering destitution. They have little to eat. And things are even worse back at home. Now the German soldiers discover that their enemies are well supplied with food and equipment. Until now, they believed their country's propaganda that the enemy was much worse off than Germans were. Feldwebel, bringen Sie mal Ordnung in den Haufen. Die Männer begreifen nicht, dass der Engländer offenbar besser denn je mit Vorräten versorgt ist. Bei uns zu Hause verhungern die Leute, aber das hier, das erklären Sie mal. Es ist doch fast geschafft. Herr Leutnant, fast geschafft seit vier Jahren? Fast geschafft zum Verrecken. Abmarsch! Und das ist keine Bitte, Soldaten. Machen wir es wie in Russland. Da werden die Offiziere diese Leute schon einfach an die Wand gestellt. Willkommen. So, meine Damen, braucht ihr noch eine extra Einladung? Hopp, 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 hopp! Setzt euch gefälligst in Bewegung! Und dann eben los geht's! Bewegung, Bewegung, Bewegung! Bewegung, wie ich hier sehe! Abwasch! As they advance on the Somme, the Germans conquer vast territories. But these are desolate landscapes, scenes of destruction from battles of the previous years, monuments to futility. After a week of continuous fighting, the troops are exhausted, their stock of ammunition depleted, and the bridges and roads in front of them have been destroyed by the retreating enemy. The British resistance grows stronger day by day. This rapid German advance came at a great cost, 250,000 German soldiers lie dead or wounded. Most of them well-trained elite troops. The German Army High Command decided to commence the attack initially against the British, but now the offensive will be continued elsewhere against the French. Yeah, ja, eben das auch noch. Yeah, ja, and wo sind die Matratzen? Hier auf. Lassen Sie auch noch die Matratzen mitnehmen. Soll die eben auf dem Boden schlafen? Ich kann es auch nicht ändern. Madame? Nous avons reçu l'ordre d'assurer la provision de monde soldats. Nous avons besoin de vêtements et aussi tous les matelas. Mais, Madame, c'est la guerre. La conduite des Boches en France est honte. The Boches' behavior in France has been scandalous. Incroyable, it's unbelievable how much plunder they are taking back to Germany. Ils vont de quoi remeubler leur ville. They'll have enough to completely rebuild every one of their towns. But one day, the tables will be turned. We'll go over there, and then we'll be the ones stealing, setting fires and pillaging. Car à eux. Je suis là. Non, non, non. Dégagez, sale boche. Yves Congar is 14 years old. He and his family lived in Sedan. The city was one of the first to be conquered by German troops during the autumn of 1914. Now the city is a marshalling point for the next German offensive against the French army in the Champagne. To ensure proper supplies for their combat troops, the Germans have ruthlessly taken advantage of all resources in the occupied territories of northern France and Belgium. In previous years, the residents' food reserves have been confiscated. Then, able-bodied men were used as forced labor. Now, soldiers plunder houses. Est-ce que tu te rends compte des conséquences de tes mots? Je ne sais pas de quoi vous parlez. Tu ne sais pas? Tu ne sais pas ce que veut dire Bosch? 
Bush, 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 bush. C'est pas très futé, mon garçon. Ne te manque pas de moi. Nein, Herr Major. Tu n'es pas assez jeune pour ne pas être puni. Six mois de prison, ça va très vite. Va au piquet et réfléchis-y, mon garçon. À petit poste. Allez, vas-y. Vas-y. Oh, Jésus, je t'en prie. I believe firmly in France and in God. And I take refuge in the knowledge that France will celebrate total victory. Amen. There came the crash of heavy guns far away. All day long, the bombardment increased in fury. The thunder of the guns drummed across the night, like an endless parade stealing away all sense of time. And then, shots beyond the courtyard. Conflict breaks out all over Russia between the revolutionary Bolsheviks and the representatives of the old order. In the course of a few months, skirmish violence develops into a merciless civil war. The communists are opposed by the White Guards, fractious groups of monarchists, landowners, and officers who are constantly fighting with each other. These bloody events soon claim millions of people's lives, just as many as the war did. Je te veux, mon garçon. Viens là. Tu as euh, 13 ans, n'est-ce pas? Tu peux supporter un bar de coupe? À 13 ans, on devient un homme. Alors viens. Nous buvons à la santé d'Allemagne. Heute Nacht avoir ich abrücken, um zu singen. Paris. Wir kommen. Hat zwar ein bisschen gedauert, aber wir kommen. À Paris. Et à la victoire. By the summer of 1918, with the success of their offensive against the French at Rennes, the Germans press closer to Paris than they have ever done before. They attack the French capital with long range artillery. Hundreds of people die. Panic breaks out among civilians. And just as in the first days of the war, hundreds of thousands flee the city. But the Germans are unable to exploit any military advantage from their attack. The French and the British have learned from their recent defeats and let the German advance overreach itself. Then they counterattack. Now for the first time, there are American divisions fighting on the side of the Allies. They attack the Germans with their own weapon, poison gas. Gas, gas, gas! On August 8, 1918, British and French troops, 140 kilometers north of Paris, launched their first major counteroffensive. I turned around and saw a strange sight. Von hinten, soldiers were coming out from our trenches with their hands up. Towards the enemy lines, and their hands held high. 
Die Kompanie ergibt sich nicht! Die Lage ist in keinster Weise aussichtslos! Leider, I held a pistol in my hand and I wanted to gun down those cowards. Ihr seid doch keine Feiglinge, Jungs! Schnell ab! Schnell ab! Ruhig, 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 ruhig! Ruhig! Halt's Maul! Ganz hart! Halt's Maul! Ich will euch anziehen! A large section of the German front collapses at the Battle of Amiens under the onslaught of the Allies. 15,000 men surrender within a few hours. This was an event without precedent. In more and more positions, the German defensive line is broken. The soldiers no longer see any sense in fighting when their promised victory had failed to materialize. This heavy defeat is a shock to Germany's allies. They themselves are already tired of the war and are only continuing to fight in fear of German retribution. The order of the day now is every man for himself. August the 8th is a black day for the German army in the history of this war. This loss robs me of any hope to turn the tide again in our favor. The war must end. The Crown Council has concluded with deep regret that the war is lost and that there is no alternative but to ask for peace. Only this way can we protect our country from ruin. I am now convinced and have seen for myself that Germany is losing the war. We must do everything in our power to exit this war. Our enemy's success had far-reaching consequences. It shook our belief in the invincibility of the Germans. It robbed us of all hope of a German victory. Gentlemen, as promised, here's your opportunity to photograph some German prisoners. Hands up, Fritz! These Germans seem like frightened rabbits, gathering up their courage just to peer out of their burrows. We have now the most stirring opportunity to show greatness in victory. Come on. One more for the Kaiser. Hey, Montague, where did you get these guys? I mean, these are hardly the terrible Huns my readers are keen to see. You got anything else? A few weeks ago, you'd have been running away from this lot. Believe me. But there appears to be hard pressure on the side of showing littleness, and so poisoning the future of the world. Quo. I can barely remember how things were before. People have been talking about peace for years, but it has never come. Aufpassen! Das gilt auch für dich, Kur. Unser stolzes Heer hat gegen eine Übermacht der Feinde ringend eine schwere Niederlage erlitten. Nun gilt es, mit aller Kraft noch einmal in einer wahren Volkserhebung aller Männer und Frauen. Hast du etwas zu sagen, Kur? Noch einmal! Noch eine Kraftanstrengung! Noch ein paar Tote! Ich kann das nicht mehr hören! 16-year-old Elfriede Kur lives with her grandmother in Schneidemühl in the eastern part of the German Empire. Here, the war against Russia ended with a victory. German propaganda has always insisted that Germany would ultimately triumph in the West. The people are shocked when they realize that they've been lied to. Now the country is suddenly on the brink of defeat. All certainties, all that they believed in, are gone. After four years of war, the people on the home front no longer have the strength to endure anything more. Das wird Konsequenzen haben, Fräulein Kur. Sie melden sich sofort beim Direktor. 
wie das Konsequenzen haben wird, Herr Taubert. Die taube Nuss. Ich haue ab, schmeiße hin, quittiere den Dienst. Jetzt bin ich frei. Now I was free. I would never again go to the Kaiserin August Victoria School in Schneidemühl. I was an adult from this moment on. Ich bin jetzt ein Erwachsen. Wo ist die Kompanie? Es gibt keine Kompanie mehr. Hier ist niemand mehr. Alle tot. Oder übergelaufen. Du meinst alle? Alle. Und ich gehe jetzt auch. Mensch, was willst du jetzt noch sinnlos verrecken? Sinnlos, Herr Leutnant? Aber es ist doch ein Tod fürs Vaterland. Die Vaterland magst ruhig sein, die Vaterland magst ruhig sein, versteht und treu, die war, die war. actually been hit, reality's bullet though drove deep into my body. Капитан Григорьев на службе его превосходительства адмирал Колчака. Вы ранены? Красными? Ну что, мы их загоним туда, где им место. Девушка? Марина Юрлова, ваша честь! Вы единственная выжившая в этой тюрьме. Нам нужно немедленно уходить. Этот город так легко взять, так же легко и потерять. Пойдемте, вы здесь не в безопасности. Нам надо торопиться. Быстрее! sitting in our pantry, crying. She sat there, crouched, her head in her hands. She looked so hopeless, so terribly sad. I didn't recognize her at first. Then suddenly, I realized that this was my grandmother. The sight of her shocked me. Geht es dir gut, Großmutter? Ich weiß es nicht, Kindchen. Du bist ganz heiß. Das ist das Fieber, das sie jetzt alle haben. Auch so eine Strafe Gottes. Warum? Warum will Gott uns nur immer alle strafen? Ich verstehe das einfach nicht. Weil wir es verdient haben, Elfriede. Deshalb. Let the hood continue. The convoys come and go we continuously we through the night. Groups of infantrymen. Muddy. Dirty. Their equipment gone, without helmets, 
without guns, all in complete chaos. Wollen Sie sich wenigstens aufstehen, wenn der Offizier den Raum betritt? Der Ampel Dopoma. Deutschland kaputt, Herr Major. Ja, Deutschland ist am Arsch, mein Junge. The Battle of Amiens is barely the prelude to a major offensive by the Allies on all fronts. Germans must now fight not only the countless soldiers that approach, but also hundreds of tanks and thousands of aircraft. Four million U.S. soldiers have arrived in Europe. The Allies' superiority in men and in material is overwhelming. On top of this, at Piave, the army of their ally, Austria-Hungary, suffers a crushing defeat at the hands of the Italians, the Americans, and the British. Field Marshal Hindenburg and his chief advisor, General Ludendorff, gambled everything on their spring offensive. And they lost. Now they avoid responsibility by resigning their commissions and recommending the imposition of an immediate ceasefire to their successors. So tell me, Montague, how is morale at the front? The Germans are retreating day by day. But they're fighting on. Losses are still huge, even on our side. They're all good men, but more than anything, they hope it'll soon be over. Mm. We must stick to our guns, mustn't we? Hmm? Shouldn't end the war too soon. Finish the Hun off once and for all. Can't be too harsh. Let them bleed out a little longer. That doesn't appear to be what the men think, sir. Well, that is exactly what the men should be demanding tomorrow in the papers. Cross, would you do the honors? <laughs> Gentlemen, a toast to the honest Tommy and a resounding thrashing of the heart. I hope our greedy and bloodthirsty non-competence and mm. profiteers will hold well, their tongues. I think we've all done our bit in the face of enemy fire. But there are signs we of eager baseness about. Demands for territory for ourselves, for a share of what Germany can pay. If the caterpillars of the Commonwealth had their way, our part in this war, noble, at first, would end in meanness. Hmm. You were saying, Montague? It won't be worth one more drop of blood to pursue this war if the enemy is already defeated. For the British and the French, only the total defeat of the enemy will justify the lives of their fellow countrymen lost to this war. They submit more and more onerous demands on Germany that the army should surrender their heavy artillery and retreat beyond the Rhine. That the German high seas fleet be turned over to English hands. The Allies no longer acknowledge the Kaiser in their negotiations, and they call for a new democratically elected government. Wilhelm II flees Berlin. At his army's headquarters at Spa, he gathers his devoted elite around him. A sacrificial death with the soldiers appears to be the only way out for him. I had been staying with my parents for the last several days. I was the only survivor of my company, though shot through the lungs. I donned my uniform despite my wound. 
grabbed my pistol holster and went to the train station, where trains no longer departed or arrived. And there, it appeared that a revolution had begun. The powerful German Navy was the pet project of the Emperor. It remains largely undamaged. Its admirals are planning a major attack on the far superior English fleet, a suicide mission. But tens of thousands of German sailors refuse to be pointlessly killed at sea. On the 4th of November, 1918, a refusal to acknowledge the command to attack spreads across the high seas fleet. This revolt develops into a revolution. It spreads across the country, fueled by soldiers, workers, and women alike. The rebels arm themselves and occupy strategic points in the larger cities. Hoppla, Genossen. Wen haben wir denn hier? Hast du dich verlaufen, Offiziersjunge? Dein Kaiser hat verschissen. Kurt, halt mir mal den Vogel im Auge. The strange thing was that these rebels did not seem to know what they wanted. That calmed me. Maybe they were waiting for someone to call upon them to begin the process, to start a campaign of violence. When I saw their pistols, I didn't feel scared. My heart did not race. I remained perfectly calm. Geh nach Hause, Kleiner. Du tust ja sonst noch weh. Ach komm, Genossen. Wir haben Besseres zu tun. Lass uns gehen. The lesson I learned through all of this was quite extraordinary. Many officers and old frontline soldiers in the German army cannot come to terms with defeat and revolution. They are fired up by their idols Hindenburg and Ludendorff. After his resignation, Ludendorff says that his brave fighting soldiers have just received a stab in the back, a phrase that will make history. His supporters among the officers insist that the fighting and the dying on the front lines continue. Better to die in our ruins than to be killed fleeing. We can hear the cannons very close to the west. The moment we've been waiting four years to arrive is approaching quickly now. But we fear its arrival too. The evacuation, poison gas, fire. Perhaps even death. Vive la France. Long live the Republic. This is the cry heard simultaneously in Vienna, Budapest, and Berlin. Kaiser Wilhelm abdicates and flees abroad. Austria's last emperor, Karl, resigns. Power is now held by the people. The peoples of the Habsburg Empire use their new freedom to break away from Vienna and to establish their own nation states. In Germany, on November the 9th, 1918, two republics are proclaimed. One is built on a socialist Russian model and the other is sponsored by the middle class who are intent on reconciliation with the old elite. The people call for one thing only, an end to the war. They demand immediate peace at any price. We had been hiding a full day with no news, no gunfire, in total silence. Combien de temps on va encore rester ici? Jusqu'à ce que la situation soit plus sûre. Mais 
Comment le savoir si on ne va pas voir Cette coupure du monde était ce qu'il y avait Being cut off like this from the world was the worst part. Unsure if we were still slaves or free citizens of France again. Est-ce que c'est la paix Est-ce que la guerre est finie At 11 o'clock on the 11th of November 1918, church bells ring out across Europe. For years, they have been silent, but now it's the guns that are silent. Germany's new government has accepted all the conditions of the Allies. This world war leaves 19 million dead. 20 million wounded or maimed, and an entire continent in ruins. On all sides, the war's survivors cry out for vengeance. Reconciliation holds no place for them now. Grief and mourning are everywhere. On this day, I decided to find the grave of the only soldier I had ever truly known, young Lieutenant Werner Waldecker, who wanted to kiss me when I was still but a child, and then was shot out of the sky in his airplane. And it's had so many dead. It was dark already. And I couldn't read the names on the crosses. I was scared I wouldn't be able to find him. How would I recognize his among all the other graves? They all look the same. In death, we are all the same. So I prayed. I prayed. Lieber Gott, bitte lass mich das Grab finden. Es war doch damals da. Es muss auch heute noch da sein, bestimmt. Bestimmt. War was declared in 1914 to restore order to a world that had slipped out of kilter. Five years later, Europe is a slaughter field. In Versailles, Saint-Germain, Trianon, and Sèvres, peace treaties are finalized and accepted. But both victor and vanquished alike feel like they have been cheated. Has Germany been punished enough? Ask the French. Why is our empire on the brink of bankruptcy, even though we won? Ask the British. Why can't we live in peace with each other, even though we now have our own countries? Ask the people of the former Habsburg monarchy. Do we need a new war to wipe out the shame of defeat? In Germany, radical politicians are already working on an answer to that one. And then I found it. The rose that I had bought a long time ago was withered and black, but it was still there.